So welcome all of you. Yes, we are starting. Welcome all of you to Progress 2020. Um, it is an absolute pleasure for me to uh, to have so many of you having registered. Uh, it is such a pleasure and such an honor to have such a big group uh, having registered. Uh, uh, and now uh, I'll just quickly ask Lakshmi to, we will start with the program since we are starting a little late. Um, now Lakshmi will introduce uh, Dr. Uh, R.N. Preeti. So we will yes. start the program today with a short script to the point session, which is the unique feature of progress. You asked, we checked. Usually clear cut messages are delivered in this session. And for this today, we have Dr. Preeti, Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Houston Medical College, as well. I want to add that she was one of our brilliant students and a hard working registrar who is now on the faculty of the Department of CNC. Preeti, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, she, he'll turn over the sharing to you now, Preeti. Yeah, thank you. At the start, I would like to congratulate Dr. Lakshmi and Dr. Geeta for the friend book that you have put out. I'm sure it's going to be a blessing for all the students and the teachers. I'll just start with the you know, sharing the screen. So we start on with the topic for the today, uh, immunization and pregnancy. Welcome you all to the Progress 2020. As we start this um, topic, we will be looking at the reasons why we need to vaccinate pregnant women and how vaccination works in pregnancy and what are the recommended vaccines. We will also be looking at each uh, illnesses where the, the burden in pregnancy. We will look at the benefits and the safety of the vaccine for the illness and the timing and dosage, we will also look at the recommendations that are currently available. Thank you, Dr. Preeti. Can you please maximize your uh, presentation, please? Uh, just a second. At the bottom. After your screen, you can just click on that so that it will be a slideshow for us. Ah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So, why we need to vaccinate in pregnancy? There are immunological changes that happen in pregnancy, and this is basically to allow the mother to tolerate the fetus, which is really semi allogenic to the mother. But these immunological changes actually increases the susceptibility of the women and the fetus to the infection. And when the infection happens, it is more at risk of having a serious outcome. And for the baby, when the baby is born, the immaturity of the immune system makes them more susceptible to infection. By immunizing a pregnant woman, there are two benefits. One is directly on the mother. There is a direct protection of the mother against the vaccine preventable illness and thereby protecting the fetus. And once the baby is born, there is a trans, uh, by then the infant gets the antibodies from the mother through the placenta. So, how much antenatal vaccination works? When the mother is vaccinated, it induces innate humoral and cell mediate immunity. And this protects the mother and against the infection, and thereby less chance of the baby getting infection through vertical transmission. And with the maternal IgG production, this gets transferred to the, through the placenta to the baby. And when the baby is born, the baby is born with passive immunity. And the mother transmits IgA, IgG, IgM, and IgD, that is through the breast milk and to the neonate. So when do we vaccinate the mother? IgG can be transferred from the mother to the baby from 13 weeks onward, but we see this is maximum in the third trimester. And at term, actually, the fetal IgG levels are more in the baby than in the mother. This is because of the active transport. 
And the timing of the vaccination is actually based on the risk of the disease and the gestational age of the mother. And this we will see on with individual vaccination. So the type of vaccine that can be given, not all vaccines can be given in pregnancy. If it's an inactivated or a dead or a toxic preparation, they have no evidence of fetal risk and thereby it is safe in pregnancy. The live vaccines are not recommended and it is avoided because there are no, no conclusive studies which tells us that it is safe in pregnancy. And there is a theoretical risk of the transplacental transfer of a vaccine induced infection to the fetus. So, what are the recommended vaccines? Uh, the vaccines include in, uh, vaccine against influenza and tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. There are vaccines available for special circumstances as in hepatitis A, hepatitis B, meningococcal, and there is a travel for, uh, in an endemic area for yellow fever, or when there is a pro axis exposure to rabies. We will look at the influenza vaccine. It's, what is the burden of the Ill illness in pregnancy? Influenza tends to be severe when it occurs, occurs in a pregnant woman or in a postpartum woman than in a non-pregnant woman. And this is basically because of the changes that happen to the immune system and the heart and the lung in a pregnant woman, which makes them more prone to a serious illness. And this can be worse in a woman who already has an underlying medical condition. For the fetus, there is an intrauterine risk, death risk and also risk of a small for gestational age and preterm birth. Okay, this is a study which we did in uh, AMC Velo. This was a to study the outcomes of influenza in pregnancy over a period of two years between 2015 to 2017, and this included 650 women. Out of this, 476 had influenza like illness. In that, 174 had PCR well, confirmed influenza, while 302 the remaining were influenza negative ILS uh, illness. And Did the one that Turn on your video. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, Preeti, can you turn on your video, please, so that we can uh, see? Right at the bottom, you'll see stop video. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So the remaining 124 were the gestational age matched control for this uh, influenza positive mother. We noticed that 28% of the women had influenza A, which is H1N1 type, and 54% of them had H3N2, and 18% were influenza B. What we noticed in this study was that influenza was seen all, all around the year, and the peak was between September to October. The lowest prevalence was between March to August, and the highest was between November to February. And when the illness happened, and it tend to be severe in requiring an inpatient care and ICU care in those with influenza positive. And this influenza caused six times more maternal morbidity and one third of them required inpatient care. And for the new, uh, for the baby, it meant increased trend, trend towards the preterm birth with a relative risk of 2.75. And many of them required an ICU care, but we did not notice a change, a different rate in the small for gestational age. So by giving a vaccine for influenza in pregnancy, according to CDC and FOXI, we can actually reduce the risk of flu-associated acute respiratory illness by 50%, and the risk of being hospitalized with flu by 40%. And for the baby, this even gives the protection for the uh, infant up to six months by 63%. So is it safe to give influenza in vaccine? There are many studies which have looked at the safety, the efficacy of the vaccine, and there are enough studies to tell us it is safe. And this, if you notice, it is the inactivated influenza vaccine that is recommended in pregnancy and not the live one. The available forms are influenza uh, vaccines are trivalent and the quadrivalent vaccine. Trivalent has three strains, H1N1, H3N1, and one strain of influenza B, while two strains are there in the quadrivalent vaccine. This antigenic drift and antigenic shift is something that is peculiar with the influenza where we see that there are small genetic mutations that continue to happen in the surface proteins of this influenza, uh, that is an antigenic drift that we see. That is the reason why we need to uh, check the vaccine every year to match the strain. Well, this antigenic shift is something very particular to influenza type A. This is something which has a major change in the mutation, the change in the H1 and H and the N surface protein. 
This is when the pandemic happened, as in the Shahjahan in 2009. So the timing for vaccination, influenza can be given at any gestational age, it is safe. And this is based on the illness at that point of time. If there is a risk of having an influenza as in the period of winter or an October flu season, that is when the vaccine is recommended. Moving on to diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. Tetanus has been there with us for many years, and as we all know, it has a high case fatality rate. In 2015, global data shows 35% of the illness in the newborn were from South Asia, and India had said 2,404 cases had been reported to WHO from uh, India in 2012. This TT in pregnancy was actually started in 1983, and in India it became a universal vaccination program by 1990. And by 2013 to 14, we had less than 500 cases of neonatal tetanus, which means by 2015, India is being known to have eliminated neonatal tetanus, which also means that we need to continue with the vaccination to keep this under this rate. For diphtheria, you know, there has been a new uh, re emergence of diphtheria infections globally, most commonly from Southeast Asia, Asia, and India is actually the three fourth contributor to this illness. And moving on to pertussis, we have noticed again from 2000 there has been re emergence of pertussis. And when you see that the infant in the infant age group, 60 to 1 to 90 percent of them are actually between the age of 0 to 3 months. When the newborn is vaccinated, the infant is vaccinated, the vaccine starts from the six weeks of age, which means the antibody takes time to form, and the period of zero to three months, the child is very vulnerable to purposes. And that is where the maternal vaccination helps. A study in India in 2007 showed 98 cases of purposes, and uh, many of them were infants. And when the baby gets purposes, many of them have pneumonia, apnea, convulsions, and encephalitis. So what are the options that we have to, against these illnesses? Tetanus toxoid, as we know. Um, there are two different recommendations currently with the poxy. The first dose is given in the second trimester, the second dose is four weeks from the first dose. And in subsequent pregnancies, one booster dose is recommended if the pregnancy is within five years. While NHM, the National Health Mission, and the Health and Family Welfare Government of India Mentions the first dose can be given early in pregnancy and the second dose four weeks after the first dose, but a booster is recommended if it is within three years, only one dose is needed. The other option we have is TD, that is tetanus and adult diphtheria. Actually, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in India had recommended replacing the TT with TD, and this is in the National Immunization Program from 2018 onwards. This is again in accordance with the WHO's recommendation to replace TT with TD. This dose is similar to the tetanus one. TD first dose in the first early early in pregnancy, second dose four weeks after the first dose, and the booster one dose is recommended if the pregnancy is within three years. The Tdap, that is the tetanus toxoid, reduced diphtheria toxoid, and the acellular pertussis. This includes the pertussis vaccination. As we saw that the baby needs protection in the first three months of age, and this vaccine is recommended between 27 to 36 weeks of gestational age, because we saw that the IgG transfer is at the highest in the third trimester, and the recommendation is give it earlier in every, and it is recommended in every pregnancy. This is according to ACOG and CDC, while RCOG even says it can be given after 20 weeks. While the FOXY recommends, so as the first dose of TT is being given, the second dose of TT or the TD can be replaced with a TDAP vaccine. So this vaccine for special circumstances, as you can see, there is hepatitis B. If the woman is actually uh, completing her schedule during the pregnancy, it can be done. Or if the woman is at a high risk for infection. Hepatitis A, when there is a travel to an endemic area. Yellow fever vaccine, as you note, it's a live vaccine. This is the only live vaccine that can be given in pregnancy. If there is a risk of an yellow fever infection, the travel is avoided. But if the travel to an endemic region is unavoidable and the risk of exposure is high, everything vaccine can still be given. Rabies, as usual, with the post exposure prophylaxis, can be given safely in pregnancy. Typhoid, if there is an endemic region travel, which is unavoidable. Pneumococcal and meningococcal are the other vaccines that can be given in pregnancy when it is indicated. Let me come to the end of this presentation. Thank you, everyone. For listening.
Thank you, Preeti. Yeah, yeah, that was really to the point, and we asked and you checked. Thank you. Thanks. Now, Deepa, uh, move on, shall we? Yes. So, uh, right now, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome all of you, all the participants, to Progress 2020. Those who have been attending Progress for many, many years know that we uh, our last progress was held in 2017, and I took a very difficult decision not to uh, go ahead with this uh, conference. Pra uh, progress stands for Practical OG Congress, and it, uh, it has, uh, we started it in 1993, and it became the pre one of the premier conferences in India because it was focused for the practitioner who was absolutely intent on practicing evidence-based medicine for their patients, people who wanted to follow protocols and procedures in uh, smaller hospitals, in bigger hospitals, but you know, for basically in a country like India where we are low resource. So therefore, progress became from year to year to year, we had uh, huge numbers of registrants and it was always such a pleasure and we also selected some excellent speakers. Again, we chose them for two very important reasons. We did not choose them uh, just because they were professors somewhere or they were uh, office bearers. We chose them for a simple reason. They were people who were invested in providing excellent care for patients, people who were invested in practicing good medicine, evidence-based medicine, and people who could articulate articulate their thoughts clearly. And that's why progress uh, went from strength to strength and became one of the most popular uh, conferences in India. I was uh, very um, upset or saddened because I could not start, uh, because I had to stop uh, progress in 2017. But things happen for mysterious reasons and I am very pleased that we uh, ended up uh, do, uh, starting it up again in 2020. Uh, Lakshmi, would you just like to say something about our book launch now? Sure. I'm truly a privilege to welcome you all to today's progress and the launch of the book editions of Obstetrics Second Edition. As Gita said, uh, the progress series of conferences extremely popular and I remember being part of it from the time she started it to almost the uh, last one and uh, with the students and teachers um, all from across, all over India across India actually attend this conference and so we thought uh, what would be a better occasion than this particular Congress for us to launch the book so this will also ensure, ensure information um, about this book to the students and teachers all over. And uh, it also gives us an opportunity to share our happiness and the joy of holding our baby, no, our book in our hands. The first edition of the book was also published in a program that was in 2015. And the book was actually sold out the same day. And we authors had to actually also part with our author copies to, you know, you know in order not to disappoint The book has subsequently become the standard textbook, um, which has been recommended by many teachers in many of the institutions for the undergraduates and postgraduates alike. And we've been getting excellent feedback about this positive encouraging. So when we thought about the release of the second edition, uh, and the publishers, Walter Clover, suggested a webinar. Geeta immediately came up with this idea. Why not have a Progress 2020 and release the book as well, um, just to probably continue the tradition. And also, of course, an opportunity to meet the entire team of faculty and all the uh, participants. And so here we are. Um, releasing, um, assembled here for the release or launch of the book, Essentials of Obstetrics, um, second edition. Thank you, faculty, special guest, Dr. Evita and Radhika, students, and the team from Walter Kluwer for being here with, with us today on this joyous occasion. Welcome to you all.
It's, I am now going to do two things. One, I'm going to uh, dedicate Progress 2020 to the frontline warriors, which is all of you who are out there, uh, out there and seeing patients in very unprecedented times when we have been uh, caught in a pandemic of very mysterious proportions, very scary proportions, and we really have to uh, uh, thank all the doctors, all the obstetricians who have not let down uh, the patients, and therefore Progress 2020 is dedicated to uh, the frontline warriors. I would like to now introduce uh, my next speaker. We have had a tradition in um, progress of introducing new speakers, and one of the uh, people who uh, really, really impressed me when I first heard him speak was Dr. Shaijas, uh, and many of you know Shaijas very, very well. You have heard him in many, many national conferences, and I would like to say that Progress was the first national platform that he spoke at. And it is my absolute privilege to uh, introduce Shaijas, who's not just a brilliant gynecologist, but also a polymath. He is a movie director, he is an actor, he is a singer, he is a dancer. He is the whole package. And uh, he actually is one of my favorite people, and I, it's a pleasure to introduce him uh, to speak on a matter which is extremely important, and that is the SARS-CoV-2, and why and how do we deal with it. The problem is that SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy is something which we don't have enough data on, but for the past nine months, 10 months, a lot of data is coming in. And we need to know, as obstetricians, what is the effect of SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy. And Shaijas is now going to tell us what exactly we know now about it. Shaijas? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Geeta Madam. Uh, I'm so happy that I got my voice back uh, to be at Progress uh, one more time. Um, I hope you can see my screen now and I am audible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wonderful to be here today yet again. Um, it's been a journey from the first progress to this particular day, and uh, I cherish every moment of that entire journey. Uh, big congratulations uh, again to Geeta Madam and uh, Lakshmi Madam for coming out with that uh, newborn even during COVID times, probably the only newborn who is uh, not at all at risk of ending up uh, with uh, an infection. There's only positivity to it, but positivity in a, in a very, very good way. And I hope uh, uh, I can get started. I can unmask and probably get started. Now, SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy. Now, I have a task at hand because this is probably a topic which we can discuss uh, over an entire day with uh, people coming from multiple specialities. But let me attempt to do justice to this topic. Uh, but my issue is I have Geeta Madam on one side. I have the clock which is sticking on the other side, and I am squeezed in between. And I hope that uh, I progress through this lecture without getting the sneak, without getting tachypneic, and without my saturation levels falling below 90, uh, which, as you all know, are the most commonest manifestations of any pregnant lady infected with COVID. So fasten your seat belts and get ready for this hopefully exciting journey about how much we know about COVID infection in pregnancy. Now, why is SARS-CoV-2 different from the other viruses? Now, this virus is something which has the potential to cause a multi-organ dysfunction. It involves the release of inflammatory cytokines that can induce the production of tissue factor and activate thrombin, 
So you're dealing with a virus which can actually induce a hypercoagulable state which can actually add on to the state pregnancies as actually is. If I can move on, this is probably the most important question. Does pregnancy increase the risk of acquiring or of developing severe disease? For the first question, I would tell you today, though there were many concerns in the initial days of COVID, pregnancy does not increase the risk of acquiring a COVID infection. But as we all know, due to the alteration in immune function, the increase in oxygen consumption for the pregnant lady, the edema of the respiratory tract that they are prone to, the risk of ending up in severe disease could be increased for COVID infection in pregnancy. Now, severe disease, as you all know, is defined when you have a respiratory rate of more than 30 and an SpO2 levels which are falling below 90. Now, we are talking about maternal ICU admissions, which were required in almost 7% of women with severe disease, and the need of intubation, which was needed in almost 3 to 4%, is what the Lancet August 2020 article would tell you. Which are the highest risk groups amongst pregnant women? They are the ones who are elderly the ones who are obese, the ones who are hypertensive and diabetic is what the GBMJ article from 2020 does tell you. Now, the more worrying question, does pregnancy increase the risk of dying from COVID-19 infection? Now, fortunately, the risk of dying from COVID-19 is only around 1%. And this is such a big relaxation such a pleasant news when compared to the SARS-CoV-1. They did not call it one because they did not expect a two coming. So they call it SARS-CoV, which hit us in 2003. And at that point of time, the maternal mortality rate was somewhere in the range of 20 to 25%. So when compared to that, COVID-19 gives us some relief. I have some data which is coming from Kerala of almost 3,800 plus COVID pregnancies and 100 1,800 plus deliveries, and it tells us that only less than 1% of COVID mothers develop severe disease. But the worrying factor is the risk of dying for those women who had severe disease is almost one in five. So almost 20% of women who develop severe disease died. That's a cause of concern. Moving on, how many visits she has to make that walk towards you? Antenatal visits, how much is enough? And how much is too much? Pre-COVID times, uh, the WHO told us that it had to be a minimum of eight and anything less than five was associated with more maternal and perinatal complications. So how do you plan it? And this was a big dilemma all these months. Now we have a reasonable plan. And the reasonable plan is the first visit could be at suspicion or diagnosis of pregnancy. For all obstetricians, do remember to get the max and that should be your policy. So take a good history, do an initial screen for medical disorders, look at her mental makeup. Very, very important because she is getting pregnant at the most troublesome times. Even a non-pregnant person is unable to bear it. So just imagine somebody, uh, her mental makeup, and she's getting pregnant at these pandemic times. Do the initial investigations, do an ultrasound to confirm the pregnancy, and you can give the first dose of TT or TD, whichever you're following. The second visit could be at the 11 to 14 weeks. Uh, remember to measure her blood pressure, an NT scan, a biochemical screen for trisomies, the preeclampsia screen, and the second dose of TT. Now, if you think there is no suspicion of an ectopic pregnancy, you can skip the initial visit and combine these two and make it directly at 11 to 14 weeks. So, the second visit then would come at 18 to 20 weeks. Remember to look at her blood pressure, hemoglobin, urine protein, anomaly scan, Look at the cervical length, start her on hematinix and calcium, and order for a GTT at 24 weeks, which she can get it done from near, a nearby lab and inform you. Third visit at 28 weeks, uh, the time when fetal viability is coming into the picture. Tell her to look at fetal movements. Again, assess her mental health because she's probably approaching a day of delivery in these pandemic times. Think of antenatal classes, maybe through online blood pressure, hemoglobin, urine protein, just like any other visit, and an add-on would be an anti-D prophylaxis for an RH negative mother. Fourth visit, between 32 and 34 weeks, she's more, about, more concerned about the fetal well-being. Growth abnormalities have been noted in such pregnancies, so look at the growth scan, look at the Doppler, uh, help her decide on the birthing route, 
tell her that isolation is a good thing to follow at this point of time especially if there is someone in your home who frequently goes in and goes out and if you are giving a tdap vaccine this is the time to give any time between 27 and 36 weeks the fifth and the sixth visits could be between 36 at 38 weeks and you can decide to individualize following that what are the markers of severe disease two of them i have already told you about a tachypnea and an spo2 level falling to less than 90 also need to look at tachycardia a heart rate more than 130 and a mean arterial pressure falling below 55 and always be concerned about an unresponsive mother if any of these markers of a severe disease are present get your multidisciplinary covid team into action and let the team take over and do the best for your patient how does covid affect pregnancy the most favorite question by all now if you look at the data it will tell you that the incidence of preterm birth is increased you look at the U- uk obstetric surveillance system data it gives us a figure of 27% a living systematic review tells us it's 17 the data from kanur tells us it's 8% the other thing that is increased is stillbirths and it was significantly seen when there was a rush of patients to op after the lockdown just got over people were stuck at home no antenatal visits no antenatal care and stillbirth was found to be significantly increased fetal growth restriction it's becoming an increasing concern with so many covid positive pregnancies coming into the picture now also need to be worried about a preeclampsia like syndrome which is a combination of hypertension and liver function abnormalities which is being noted in these pregnancies teratogenicity for the time being we do not have enough data to tell that this virus is teratogenic but remember that we are dealing with something which is new we hardly know anything about it so all those patients who have had a covid infection in the first trimester ensure that you do a very very good early and later anomaly scans so that you rule out any kind of retrocharactogenic effects and you report it because that might be a leading point for further research to happen it is unclear whether these outcomes are directly related to the sars cov 2 infection or is it an indirect effect because of the severe maternal illness or the iatrogenic interventions including the drugs that we are using and that only time will clarify that particular point how do you manage covid positive pregnancies as far as possible this is one message which i want to put across as far as possible wait for her to become negative before the delivery is planned because a delayed delivery after more than 7 days of covid negativity ensured that there were no babies who were positive at birth remember this and stress the need for good hydration temperature control and avoiding continued bed rest except for very very sick patients because you are dealing with a with a viral infection which could be a thrombotic event what about medical management in covid positive pregnancies it has evolved over the last few months but now we know that there are three categories of drugs which are actually required when you medically manage a covid positive pregnancy number 1 is an anti inflammatory agent number 2 is an anti viral and number 3 is anti coagulation and we look a little bit more into that when we talk about anti inflammatory agents the drug that i am talking about is steroid and a drug which is very close to the heart of every obstetrician which is dexamethasone now 6 mg per day for 10 days or until discharge whichever comes first is the schedule that you want to use now anti inflammatory agent in the form of steroid is indicated for all those patients who require supplemental oxygen to maintain saturation as well as all women who require a ventilatory support now if steroids are indicated for accelerating fetal lung maturity that is flm 6 mg im is given 12 hourly for for four doses just like your routine antenatal corticosteroid use and then you make it intramuscular once daily and you give it for a total of 10 days now this can be switched over if you want to an oral preparation either methylprednisolone 32 mg once daily or prednisolone 40 mg orally once daily look at the antivirals a relatively a newer drug in this particular indication but it appears to be a very novel nucleotide analog a dose of 200 mg once intravenously on day 1 and then 100 mg once daily for four more days for a total duration of five days the drug i'm talking about is remdesivir remember that you need to monitor lft and renal function 
during the course of this particular treatment as well as you need to take an ECG to actually look at QT interval. The cost would be anywhere between 2,800 to 5,400. For the time being, with the very limited data that is available, there are no safety concerns. From the data available, there is no fetal harm which has been documented. But remember, it's a new drug. But on the whole, because it seems to be beneficial, especially in severe disease, most of the obstetric medicine units all around the world are using remdesivir for improvement of their patients. Class number three, anticoagulation. Not a new drug for us. So remember to start heparin for all those patients when you find a saturation level which is less than 94%. Which heparin to use? You could use either use low molecular weight heparin, either as enoxaparin or daltiparin, or you could switch over to a conventional unfractionated heparin. If delivery is not imminent, it's better to start off with a low molecular weight heparin. Remember that even for those where SpO2 levels have not fallen down, mean to say asymptomatic COVID pregnancy patients who end up in a cesarean section and they are on bed for probably a couple of days without too much of ambulation, even them, you should use anticoagulation liberally because you are dealing with a virus which can incite a thrombotic event which could be devastating. This is the dosage of anticoagulation. Either it can be started based upon the body weight or it can be decided based upon your D-dimer levels. Okay, you could choose either of the heparins. You could use either of the dosing schedules. But remember to use anticoagulation liberally in COVID positive pregnancies. Oseltamivir and azithromycin. Oseltamivir primarily because for all those mothers where COVID positive mothers with respiratory symptoms or a flu-like illness, coexisting infection with H1N1 is a definite, definite possibility and we are not checking routinely for it. So, uh, giving that benefit of doubt, you should give oseltamivir and azithromycin to all COVID positive mothers with respiratory symptoms. Dose of oseltamivir is 75 milligram uh, twice daily for five days or till RT-PCR negativity, depending upon whichever your protocol is. Azithromycin 500 milligram once daily for a day, followed by 250 milligram once daily for four days. Hydroxychloroquine uh, came in as a very promising drug because there was nothing else available people thought that this could do the magic. But remember, for the time being, the data from the randomized trials will tell you that there is no benefit from treating. So most of the obstetric medicine units have stopped using hydroxychloroquine, plus the added adverse effects, which could be life-threatening, QT interval prolongation, ventricular tachycardia, elevation of liver enzymes, and all could actually worsen matters. Is there any benefit of giving zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D? Lots of WhatsApp messages being forwarded from one person to another. But remember, no real benefit shown unless you have proven a deficiency of this integral components. Which are the biomarkers of disease severity? There are a lot of biomarkers available for a non-pregnant person. But interpretation of those biomarkers, because they are already altered because she is in a pregnant state, could be an issue. So interpretation of markers like D-dimer and LDH, which is otherwise increased in pregnancy, becomes very difficult. So we have something which is slightly more better. One is the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. A ratio more than four would suggest severe disease. We could look at lymphopenia. An absolute lymphocyte count less than 800 could tell you that there is severe disease. CRP is a very, very useful marker for systemic inflammation. The cutoff used is more than 100 milligram per liter. And ferritin levels, very important. Anything more than 500 microgram per liter can tell you that she is going in for severe disease. ECG and chest X-ray. ECG primarily to look at QT prolongation, especially if you are planning to use an antiviral agent, and chest X-ray to actually look at the extent of pneumonia, and more importantly, also to look at pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum, to which these COVID positive patients are more prone to. Mode of delivery. Very confusing. Now, when the number of COVID pregnancies were relatively less, the decision making appeared very easy. At that point of time, the guidelines said that Cesarean section only for obstetric indications, okay? Though they said that majority of deliveries uh, ultimately happened around the world via a cesarean section. You look at data from UK, it told us a figure of 59%. A systematic review that came in the European Journal uh, in 2020, September, told us 72%. But now, with increasing number of COVID positive pregnancies, some new knowledge being gained about this virus infection in pregnancy 
and the uncertainty regarding vertical transmission that still remains more and more people are being delivered vaginally we have a medical college in kerala with the maximum number of covid positive deliveries in kerala which has been able to achieve an overall cesarean section rate as low as 38% and a primary cesarean section rate of almost close to 20% now what they are doing is right or wrong only time will tell because there are some logistic problems related to a vaginal delivery one is uh, absence of negative pressure labor delivery recovery, recovery room units in in most of the centers containment is an issue people moving in from one labor room to the other covid labor room how to prevent them that's a big big issue exposure of each and every health worker with the limited staff that is available in our healthcare centers that's a major issue labor duration could be unpredictably long and you don't know how much you want all your staff and your and your and your support staff to get exposed to this particular virus labor analgesia was becoming an issue entenox is almost out and even opioids will have to be used with reservation especially for patients with respiratory symptoms only in consensus with your medical team and more and more concern being raised whether vaginal birth itself could be an aerosol generating process so just forget about the use of mask when she's training and all isn't it so you're exposing your entire staff into such a scenario so you need to think very very logically much more than what evidence would tell and take a very logical decision fine as you move on while planning for a cesarean section remember that donning and doffing does take a lot of time hence if you are taking a decision for an emergency cesarean section take it very early regional anesthesia is preferred to general anesthesia because ga is an aerosol generating process before i finish it's a final words about neonatal care and breastfeeding delayed cord clamping a very controversial issue but for the time being since we do not know much about this virus it has to remain as a suspended practice for the time being breastfeeding and rooming in though there was a recent article in the lancet which was published in 2020 which detected sars cov2 rna in the breast milk if you overall look at the benefits of breastfeeding most organizations are recommending for breastfeeding and rooming in but remember to take that extra bit of care baby has to be 6 feet from the mother mother has to wear the mask properly she has to take care of the hand hygiene i'll tell you some tell you some numbers which would actually make things very clear in your mind vaginal delivery when compared to a cesarean section seems to increase the odds of a baby ending up with neonatal infection by almost 1.39% but if you look at breastfeeding and rooming in that seems to increase the odds of baby ending up in an infection by a factor of almost 12 so even when you tell breastfeeding and rooming in do not relax you need to keep on counseling them take care of the precautions the mother is taking while she is handling the baby and always have a covid negative attendant to help her whether she is at home or she is at hospital discharge post vaginal delivery do it within 48 hours post cesarean section you can do it early maybe somewhere around 3 to 4 days as early as possible depending on your center counsel about the baby care at home because the odds ratio is significantly high for, for during this breastfeeding time remember to continue thromboprophylaxis for at least 10 days because postpartum still continues to be a very high risk period for a thrombotic event and remember that mental health assessment add on the factors the postpartum psychosis the postpartum blues that can set in especially in these tough times for the mother who has just delivered especially for the for the person who has become mother for the first time now i cannot leave you from a progress lecture without some very clear take home messages from whatever is available from around the world pregnancy does not increase the risk of acquiring a covid infection but it definitely increases the risk of ending up in severe disease antenatal visits has to be at the most needed times and every obstetrician has to utilize every visit to the maximum possible extent respiratory rate more than 30 a spo2 level less than 90 indicates severe disease preterm births still birth rates fetal growth restriction rates all seem to be increased in covid positive pregnancies 
as far as possible remember to delay delivery till she has achieved a covid negative status oseltamivir and azithromycin for all symptomatic mothers dexamethasone remdesivir heparin is life saving especially for women with severe disease neutrophil lymphocyte ratio crp and ferritin are more useful biomarkers because their interpretation is much more difficult than the routine ones make a very very logical choice on the mode of delivery depending on the setup you are working breastfeeding and rooming in reasonably recommended now but remember that it has to be done with utmost utmost care because the odds of increasing the chances of the baby getting infected are significantly more now we are going through some very very tough times and i feel we could say how much we know about covid infection in pregnancy more honestly we could say how much we don't know about covid infection in pregnancy but remember that adaptability is the name of the game and i was just thinking to give some vocal cords a bit of rest if i had to use a microphone to communicate with my patients with all the spokes and the and and the wheels and and the spikes are we almost looking like the virus itself i don't know now i would end on a very very positive note which they used to tell us when the devastating floods hit kerala that together we shall overcome this soon thank you so much it's been a pleasure to be here today thank you sajit for for another absolutely brilliant uh, lecture uh if you were in a hall in progress as usual i would be hugging you right now because you gave such clarity on this subject with such a tough subject and now all those who are attending will know that why we choose the people we do to speak at uh, progress thank you so much thank you so much thank you ma'am it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce professor lakshmi seshadri it's uh, it's been a long time that i have known lakshmi um i have known her i think from the mid 80s when i first met her in cmc velo when i had gone there uh, i was invited to take part in a workshop on fetal monitoring and i realized then that she is an extraordinary person uh, in many ways very bright and i am always attracted to brilliant people she is extremely bright she is extremely straight and that's important particularly being an academic you have to be very straight you have to be very honest and when i talk about honesty i'm talking about absolute academic honesty and therefore when i realized uh, some years ago that uh, she was what she was and who she was as far as academics and brilliance was concerned she became a part of the progress family i was so happy when she asked me to co-edit uh, the uh, book essentials of obstetrics with her in 2015 and it was a very big learning curve for me because i've never written for undergraduates i had written for practitioners i had written textbooks for postgraduates but writing for undergraduates is a completely different ball game with a great amount of uh, generosity she taught me how to uh, she uh, um has um, been uh, she has uh, given oration she is an extremely popular speaker all around the country and it's my pleasure to introduce her now to ask her to give the uh, talk on hypertensive disorders in pregnancy stay up to date lakshmi thank you thank you geeta you are you are very very good for my morale especially in this corona days depression thank you so much uh let me see if you can uh my screen where is my screen not coming up mm-hmm. all right now um okay can you all yes, see ma'am. and hear me yes ma'am yes ma'am please go ahead okay ma'am. now um the, my boss geeta gave me was hypertensive disorders so pregnancy being up to date um very very common problem that we all see in the outpatient clinic 
because we know that about 8 to 10 percent of all our pregnant women have hypertension. Most of the time we see just the run of the mill um, eight third trimester onset hypertension and um, we manage them but even then we have a lot of confusion. Should I start antihypertensive? Should I not? Should I deliver her today? Should I give her a week? What do I do with this patient with a severe hypertension? Um, you know, there are a whole lot of questions. And to confuse the postgraduates much more, mm -hmm. these various committees meet every now and then and come up with new terminology, uh, new classification, new guidelines, and leave all of us quite confused. So let us see what the current evidence says and what the current recommendations are. So as I already said, there's a worldwide difference in classification, diagnosis, and management of hypertensive disorders. So the International Society for the Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy and other professional bodies formulated guidelines and updated them. Even among these guidelines, there was just broad agreement in some areas like definitions, prevention with low-dose aspirin, treatment of severe hypertension. But there's no agreement uh, with respect to target blood pressure when the hypertension is severe, timing of delivery in gestational hypertension and chronic hypertension, and antihypertensives in non-severe hypertension and many more issues. Classification has not changed very much. There are no major changes. The hypertension pregnancy is still classified into gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia. Of course, it includes the help as well, chronic hypertension, and preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension. Very simple. Now, what is new about gestational hypertension? We, of course, knew that this is uh, hypertension which started, which set in after 20 weeks of gestation and the blood pressure of 140 by 90 or above with no proteinuria and nothing else. And we also taught our students earlier that this is something that sets in after 20 weeks and disappears within three months after delivery. But now we know that we're not going to wait till then to actually figure out whether it is gestational hypertension or not. But this should be reclassified as, as the disease progresses or as pregnancy advances. It would be called preeclampsia if proteinuria or end organ dysfunction develop. Preeclampsia with severe features if the blood pressure is above the cutoff for severe hypertension, even without proteinuria. We'll come to that later, but I've just highlighted it because it's something that's confusing. Chronic, it would be called chronic hypertension if the blood pressure is elevated 12 weeks postpartum. And it would be called transient hypertension if the blood pressure is normal at 12 weeks of um, postpartum. And also remember that 25 to 50 percent of these women may progress, progress to preeclampsia. And therein lies the importance of the condition because you need to keep a close watch and manage them. If gestational hypertension sets in late in the third trimester, that is after 34 weeks, the prognosis is good and progression to severe preeclampsia is uncommon. If on the other hand it sets in early, that is less than 34 weeks, the prognosis is not as good. Progression to severe preeclampsia is more and risk of abruption, fetal growth restriction, health and stillbirth are higher. So please remember that the time of onset of gestational hypertension is important as well. Now what is preeclampsia or preeclampsia syndrome? Obviously, it is new onset hypertension, which occurs, I mean, more than 140 by 90, which occurs after 20 weeks, go check four hours, four hours apart, with proteinuria, which is what we've been taught from our and my undergraduate days. But now we know that this can be called a preeclampsia, when even if there is no proteinuria, but there is evidence of multi-organ dysfunction. So proteinuria is not essential for the diagnosis of preeclampsia. So what this basically means is that if the blood pressure is elevated, and if, even if there's no proteinuria, if she has a thrombocytopenia, if she's got an abnormal liver enzyme, if she's got a creat which is more than 1.1, whatever, she, she still becomes um, preeclampsia and not gestational hypertension anymore. How about proteinuria itself? 
Of course, it is more than 300 milligram in 24-hour urine sample, but in pregnant women, we are not going to be collecting 24-hour uh, sample to check for proteinuria. Cumbersome, not really recommended. Now, it's more than 30 in spot sample, but what is more sensitive for detecting proteinuria is spot urine protein creatinine ratio of more than 0.3. This is not something that is available everywhere, but if it is available, it is recommended that we do this to actually document proteinuria. How about urine dipstick? This is something that we continue to do in our outpatient clinic, and this is something that's very useful in secondary care settings. We still continue it in the tertiary care settings. Now, what is the cutoff? It was considered to be one plus or more, uh, and NICE guidelines even now say that it is one, um, one plus or more that should be used as a cutoff. But remember, it has a high false positive if you're using one plus as a cutoff because any infection or, uh, you know, exercise, a whole lot of things, uh, conditions can actually give rise to a um, proteinuria, which is more than just one plus. Therefore, American College in their 2019 guidelines have moved it to a two plus as a cutoff. And because of the higher accuracy, and this is what is being used in many other guidelines now in the management. Now, features, what are the features of multi-organ involvement? Platelet counts of less than a lakh, serum creatinine more than 1.1, elevated liver transaminases, pulmonary edema, cerebral or visual symptoms. Uh, they all, they are more or less the same except that growth restriction actually has been removed from this, oliguria has been removed from this, instead serum creatinine has been put in. So if a woman has either proteinuria as defined in the previous slide or any feature of multi-organ multi involvement, she would be diagnosed as having a preeclampsia syndrome. Now, what is preeclampsia with severe features? A blood pressure of more than 160 by 110 millimeters repeated within a shorter interval of perhaps 30 minutes because we are not going to wait for four hours in somebody with such high blood pressure with proteinuria or features of multi-organ involvement. Again, it is the same as for the mild or non-severe preeclampsia that it could be either proteinuria or features of multi-organ involvement. So then what is the difference between mild and severe disease? The essential difference between non-severe and severe preeclampsia is the blood pressure. It's either less than 160 over 110 or more than 160 over 110, and that's what makes the difference. How about chronic hypertension? This is something that is detected before 20 weeks or continues after 12 weeks postpartum. Preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension could be either worsening of hypertension after pregnancy. Um, after the onset of pregnancy, it could be a new onset proteinuria or worsening of proteinuria. Any one of these things happening in a chronic hypertension could um, uh, place them under preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension. And compared with preeclampsia, these women um, have the hypertension is more severe, there's a high perinatal morbidity and mortality, and higher risk of growth restriction. There are other hypertensive disorders which have been actually. Um, included by the ISS HP, the white coat hypertension and mast hypertension. In white coat hypertension, the blood pressure is elevated in office or clinic, whereas it's normal blood pressure at home, whereas in mast hypertension, it is the other way around. Remember that both these conditions can actually ultimately lead to a development of hypertension of preeclampsia. Therefore, close monitoring is actually required in these groups of patients as well. I don't really want to go into great details about pathophysiology of the condition, uh, except to say that um, in the process where there is immune maladaptation, defective trophoblastic invasion, the placenta is the one which is mostly hit, and there are um, certain substance that is angio anti angiogenic factors and angiogenic factors which are or pro angiogenic factors which are generally produced by the uh, placenta, the levels of these are altered, and these have been used in an attempt to either predict or uh, predict the development of preeclampsia or predict the onset of a severe disease or predict progression to a severe disease by various studies with varying amounts of success. And so we all need to know that these are produced here in by the placenta and the levels are altered in, in uh, preeclampsia. 
Now, in the pathogenesis, it is the endothelial da dysfunctional damage in the various organs that lead to various end organ manifestations like edema, hypertension, as thrombocytopenia, and ischemia, necrosis, and hemorrhage that you see in most of the organs. How about prediction of preeclampsia? We have got various factors, like we talked about, people have tried rollover, they have tried angios, and various other tests, and have ultimately come to the conclusion, and all the professional bodies agree, that there are no first or second trimester tests to reliably predict preeclampsia. People have used a combination of maternal risk factors, blood pressure, real placental growth factor, uterine artery Doppler. All these have been they were used, but remember, they can be used to select a uh, woman who might benefit from aspirin. But they have not, they're still experimental and they're not re recommended for routine use. So then, if we do not have any Test to predict this condition, are we going to be able to prevent it is the next question. Most of the professional bodies agree because there's enough evidence to say that low-dose aspirin in a dose of 75 to 150 milligrams daily started at or before 16 weeks prevents preterm but not term preeclampsia. Of course, we all know the risk, like there is one risk factor you, what are the risk factors? There may be two or more uh, mild risk factors and moderate risk factors, and then you, uh, may, before you make a decision on starting the low-dose aspirin. People have tried calcium, and we know that it reduces the risk only in calcium-deficient women, and therefore it is really not useful in all women. And because the dose of calcium that you need to give also is much higher and not generally um, easy for the women to take. Exercises for 50 minutes three, uh, three times a week has been shown to reduce the risk of preeclampsia, but how many of our women will be willing to do it? I'm not very sure. Now, how do we diagnose uh, hypertensive disorder in pregnancy? It's mainly clinical. It's good to know the pre-pregnancy blood pressure. You, it's good to look for other risk factors, including body mass index. Lab tests are done only to exclude other causes of hypertension and to look for multi-organ involvement. It's not a lab test that's going to tell you what kind of hypertension it is. To determine the severity of the hypertension and to assess fetal well-being. The other tests like placental growth factor, SFLT1 and placental growth factor ratio, angiogenic factors are all experimental and are not recommended for routine use. Now, a few slides on management of this condition. I have grouped gestational hypertension and non-severe preeclampsia together because they have similar blood pressure cutoffs and are managed more or less in similar fashion. Keep in mind the risk of progression to severe preeclampsia is more in non-severe preeclampsia than in gestational hypertension. Close monitoring of blood pressure is indicated in both weekly in gestational hypertension, once in 48 hours in non-severe preeclampsia. Proteinuria should be looked for every visit and features of end organ involvement to like platelet count, liver enzymes, and creat should be also checked every visit. But the, average, the frequency of antenatal visit should be tailored to suit the patient because it's not necessary to see all of them every week or is it possible or is it justified to say you need to see them once in um, three or four weeks. Once in two weeks is adequate for most and it is probably required more often if proteinuria persists or if blood pressure is persistently elevated. Is there a place for placental growth factor based tests? They may be used in gestational hypertension. It helps to predict progression to preeclampsia. These are now being included in the NICE nice guidelines, and that is the reason I have brought them in here. Is there a place for full peer scoring? That is preeclampsia integrated estimated risk scoring. This again has been tried. It was introduced way back in 2010. The first article was published in Lancet. It's useful in low resource settings, peripheral hospitals, may be used in non-severe preeclampsia, and it actually tells you which of these women are likely to progress to severe preeclampsia, and therefore, should we actually transfer them to a tertiary care center or not. And these can be used at any gestational age. And this is available in the, um, on the net, and uh, anyone can download it and use it, and the risk is calculated, and whether you need to transfer the woman or not is actually decided upon. 
There's another one called a prep scoring, which is prediction of complications in early onset preeclampsia. Now, this is also used in low reserve settings in peripheral hospitals. But this, remember, this is generally useful in pregnancy which are less than 34 weeks. Um, after 34 weeks, it is not of much use. And again, in used in non-severe preeclampsia, mild and moderate, helps in predicting the disease progression and transfer to a tertiary center. This is a scoring. Again, you could download it and use it. These are now coming in a big way. They, start, they actually were first published in 2010, 2011, 12. They are now being tried out in many low resource settings, and people find that they are useful when the uh, when in secondary level centers where uh, they need to the need to transfer them to a tertiary level center arises, and the transfer cannot happen very quickly. Therefore, if they use a scoring system and they know who has to be transferred, I think the arrangement can be made and they can be actually shifted um, without with before complications sets in and without complications. Okay. Now, anti hypertension and gestational hypertension, uh, that is non and non severe preeclampsia, this has always been controversial. We always wonder should we start when it is 90? Should we start when it is 100? We've always been taught that you wait till it is 160, 110. Of course, all of us then know, no, that is not easy. You can't wait uh, for somebody to actually develop severe hypertension. So many of us started using it when the diastolic was 100. Subsequent studies have shown that the risk of progression is much higher if you allow the blood pressure to hover around 150 by, by 100. And so um, current recommendation is to start on antihypertensives if the blood pressure is more than one persistently above 140 by night. So you check the patient. Today the blood pressure is 140, 90. You ask her to monitor blood pressure at home over a period of a week or so. Call her back and look at the blood pressure. If it has been hovering around 140, 90, 145, 95, she needs an antihypertensive. If, on the other hand, there's an occasional 140 by 90, but otherwise it's at 145, she probably doesn't require it. But most people start it when actually it is at 140 by 90. The target blood pressure is 135 by 85. Oral labetalol is a drug of choice. You can also use lefitopin. Now, how about fetal evaluation? Again, there are no definite guidelines for performing CTG or fetal growth assessment in these women. ACOG recommends weekly assessment and um, other um, professional bodies, other guidelines such as once in two weeks. The frequency can be modified based on blood pressure and clinical parameters and may be increased in preeclampsia if fetal uh, compromise is anticipated. When do we deliver them? If in gestational hypertension, blood pressure is 140, 90 to 150, 100, you might wait till 38 to 39 weeks. But in, if the blood pressure is higher and in those with non severe preeclampsia, delivery at 37 weeks is recommended. The gestational age, the blood pressure cutoff values vary. Delivery should not be before 37 weeks in uncomplicated cases and should not be delayed beyond 39 weeks in any of these. That is the bottom line. Because whether you want to deliver at 37 plus 6, 38 plus 1, all this will vary depending on the situation and depending on a whole lot of factors. But don't believe deliver before 37 weeks and don't wait beyond 39 weeks, the bottom line. Now, this is just the algorithm which tells you more or less the same thing, and I'll skip that. Now, how about management of severe preeclampsia? Admission to hospital is mandatory in all these women. There is no way you're going to manage a severe preeclampsia as our patient. Maternal ev evaluation for severity of hypertension and clinical and lab features of multi-organ involvement is absolutely mandatory, and all of us do it without being told. Assessment of gestational age is the most important because the delivery is going to be really based on this assessment of gestational age and evaluation of fetal health. If the fetus okay, can it remain inside for a few more days? Uh, is to preterm. These are the two things that we are going to be looking at when we decide on delivery. Now, all of them need immediate antihypertensive seizure prophylaxis, corticosteroids based on gestational age. I'm not going to elaborate on those. Those women at with severe preeclampsia, more than 34 weeks of gestation need to be delivered because there's nothing to be gained by waiting beyond that and maternal and fetal complications increase tremendously if you wait beyond that. Those women who are 
less than 26 weeks in a very good neonatal setup or less than 28 weeks in most of the run of the mill places, the salvageability, that is the, rate, the survival rate, um, the neonatal survival rate for babies under this gestational age is actually not very good. And there's also a lot of cost involved, there are a lot of complications associated, and if you wait, you probably get about four to seven days, and you, it really doesn't improve the uh, neonatal survival in any way, and therefore it may be much better to counsel these women and the couple and deliver them. So more than 34 weeks and less than 36 weeks and less than 26 or 28 week delivery is indicated. Now, in those women who are between this 26 to 28 weeks and 34 weeks is where we have a problem. We have to make a definite decision whether it is immediate delivery, whether it is delivery 48 hours after corticosteroids or is it going to be expectant management. Immediate delivery would be where you feel that there is absent diastolic flow, there is oliguria, there is creat which is going up, liver enzymes altered, you can't really wait abruption. So you give them 20 um, steroids but don't give the uh, usual 48 hours per delivery. Where you, if you feel you can wait, it's only an intermittent absent diastolic flow and other parameters are normal, you give them the steroids and wait for 48 hours. Whereas those who are otherwise stable, you can follow what is called an expectant management. The expectant management, remember, is only to improve neonatal survival. There is no maternal benefit. And it can achieve prolongation of pregnancy by something like 7 to 14 days, more like 7 days must be undertaken in a tertiary center. Close monitoring of mother and fetus is mandatory. And if vital growth restriction is present, the management absolutely changes because this is something that Bijoy is going to talk about later, that this becomes early onset growth restriction, that is growth restriction with hypertension. And all these women, even after expectant management, must be delivered by 34 weeks. Just a slide on chronic hypertension in pregnancy, because here preconceptional counseling becomes very important Medications must be reviewed and uh, a change to safer antihypertensives is mandatory. Start low dose aspirin at 12 weeks. Monitor for new onset proteinuria, worsening of hypertension, and continue fetal surveillance. So, to conclude, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy continue to be a challenge. It is not possible to predict or prevent the disease, but can be modified by attention to predisposing factors. Women with hypertensive disorders are at a risk for cardiovascular disease in later life, and this you must keep in mind. Maternal mortality due to the disease has reduced, but maternal morbidity and perinatal morbidity and mortality continue to be a problem with hypertensive disorders. Following guidelines ensure uniformity in clinical practice and helps in future care results. Thank you, and your attention. Thank you, Lakshmi. As usual. An absolutely clear uh, talk. Uh, will you now go ahead and introduce Uma? And just yes. before that, uh, could I also just make an announcement? Anybody who has questions, please put them in chat or in the Q&A section because uh, those questions will be answered. We have a fairly large amount of time for question and answers. And uh, uh, Dr. S. Rajshri will be going ahead and uh, taking down your questions, and we will ask the panelists uh, uh, the questions. You'll have enough time to go through whatever doubts you have. Uh, go ahead, uh, Lakshmi. Yeah, I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Uma Ram. She, of course, is known for her expert handling um, of any topic given to her, simplifying them and presenting them with great clarity. Uh, she, I have known her, I think, met her in the first progress meeting and then subsequently met her everywhere in various conferences, also known her as, uh, you know, Gita's uh, sister-in-law, etc. And great friend, fun to be with, real fun-loving personality, but uh, remember, she's also a great obstetrician and also an infertility uh, specialist. Now actually handles two hospitals and is an extremely busy person. Her special interest has always been high-risk obstetrics and um, uh, the topic now that she's going to handle multiple pregnancy, we all know that managing one high-risk pregnancy is difficult enough, but to manage somebody with two of these babies sitting inside is just not double the problem, but it's the problem that is multiplied many fold. 
and um, the we and we also see many more of these multiple pregnancies now because of the assisted reproductive technology being there and none of the, and um, when you have dr uma ram who better than her to handle a topic like this uma over to you thank you very much uh, dr lakshmi and uh, geeta it's uh, i think both of you have been uh, very good role models uh, for all of us and it's uh, always a pleasure uh, to be part of progress um usually when a topic is given for progress it's a challenge uh, today challenge has been uh, you know to try and talk about multiple pregnancy multiple problems and ensure that i i, I fish uh on time and uh, address most of the concerns that are there so i want to begin by acknowledging all the patients who have placed their immense trust uh, coming to uh, care uh, since especially uh, the uh, intervention fetal intervention unit was initiated and started in 2010 to my entire team of obstetricians because they are the ones who make all this work possible and they keep it enjoyable and fun uh to dr suresh shanti sairam and sudarshan for constantly uh, pushing the bar and teaching me a lot about multiple pregnancy so i want to begin with a few stories uh, all real uh, this is a 44 year old who presented to us with a dcda twin pregnancy from a donor who site ivf she was a diabetic on metformin she moved care and booked with us during the pandemic at 32 weeks the babies were concordant and she had continued to just have her scans as per the last scan her sugars the fasting was somewhere around 98 to 105 postprandial was between 140 and 150 she was not on regular follow up anywhere not to the ivf center or with anyone else because of the lockdown four days after she booked for care she presented with loss of vision and seizures at home she had a seizure as she was received her blood pressure was 180 over 120 a uh, mag cell was initiated iv labitol was given the team was mobilized but she arrested and could not be resuscitated despite a perimortem severe infection it was indeed an extremely traumatic late evening for us uh, this was another 27 year old spontaneous pregnancy with an mcda twin diagnosed as tttts she was worked up and laser was advised and as she was deciding she went into preterm labor and expelled both her babies post delivery her blood pressure was 150 over 100 and when she was evaluated and labs were sent her creatinine went up to 2.5 she was worked up and diagnosed to have hus renal function worsened she needed dialysis she needed extended care but thankfully she recovered another multiple pregnancy she had uh, mrs pm she had two previous preterm losses at 22 and 24 weeks had initially come for pre conception counseling then went elsewhere conceived with ovulation induction came back with a dcda twin at 12 weeks requesting reduction to a single term to reduce her chance of recurrent preterm labor the another situation of a 32 year old lady with a previous cesarean who had booked at a local phc from about 12 weeks and just referred as twins at 20 weeks and turned out that she had ncda twins with a 35% discordancy in weight between the two babies one baby's the uh, larger baby sac had an svp of uh, 13 the smaller baby had an svp of 4 the smaller baby also had a borderline ventricular megaly that needed evaluation another was a 29 year old sara one uh, uh, dcba who presented to us in spontaneous labor first cephalic second breech both were delivered normally but post delivery of the second baby she developed significant atonic pph needing shifting to theater so right there is the reason i think that this talk was given because multiple pregnancies can have multiple problems that can range from the you know something as as uh, non medical but uh, also ethical about a request for reduction to something as traumatic and tragic as a maternal loss so how do we focus on multiple pregnancies we need to look both at the mother and at the baby and we also have to keep in mind 
ethical issues and logistic challenges that come our way when we are providing care for these women. Often when we are sitting in front of a woman who, or a couple to whom we are saying that there is a multi, you have a multiple pregnancy, their concern is all about the babies. There's a lot of excitement, there's joy. Sometimes there's a little bit of apprehension, but on the whole, there's a lot of excitement. For us, we need to think of risks of the mother and the baby and risks beyond the baby. And we have to keep in mind that there are many physiological changes that happen in a multiple pregnancy that are slightly different from a singleton, including changes in the cardiovascular system, uh, the renal system, respiratory system, and coagulation system, which is what puts this woman at risk for hypertension and preeclampsia, increased risk of gestation diabetes, increased risk of preterm labor and hemorrhage, and indeed of coagulation and DVT uh, postnatally. So how do we minimize this risk? To minimize this risk in the mother, we need to actually risk stratify the mom. Uh, all twin pregnancies don't come under the same basket. If there is good evidence that older mothers with multiple pregnancies are more at risk, the mode of conception, what is the BMI, do they have other comorbidities? And based on this, we can triage the mother from a maternal perspective into is she somebody who's more high risk than uh, somebody who is just, uh, you know, a young spontaneous pregnancy with a DCBA twin without any comorbidities. And then, of course, the babies, we need to know the chorionicity and follow up. And uh, the, most of my talk will be focusing on these. There are some interventions that have been, that can be appropriately used, such as the use of aspirin in those group of women to minimize their risk of uh, uh, preeclampsia and hypertension. An appropriate use of progesterone, not for every multiple pregnancy, but for those where there is a previous risk, such as increased risk of preterm labor or when there is cervical shortening that is documented on ultrasound. It is inappropriate to use routine circlage or to advise bed rest or this increasing trend to use low molecular weight heparin in all women with multiple pregnancies. So these are things that we should not do because we, may, we don't minimize the risk and we may actually add to the complications. About 10 years ago, I think I was very happy managing multiple pregnancies because often we were ignorant of all the possible complications that these babies can actually have. Increasingly, as we understand the problems and complications and we know that there are solutions and that these solutions are not simple, straightforward solutions, they come with their own risks. So as you understand all of that, you're actually a little bit more cautious and a little bit more guarded and apprehensive when you're talking to these women within ourselves. But obviously, when we talk to them, we need to give them the encouragement to go on. So why are we worried about these babies? We worry about these babies because we know that their survival is less than that of singletons, and this survival is less for monochorionic twins than dichorionic twins. Whatever we take, whether it's a miscarriage or perinatal mortality or increased chance of preterm birth or growth restriction or even major structural defects, the chances are more in monochorionic pregnancies than in dichorionic pregnancies. So if we want to optimize outcome, we need to ensure that we are scanning serially in an appropriate manner and we begin by triaging. So who, before we get into the triage, I, there is this question about who should manage twin pregnancies. Now, anyone can manage an uncomplicated DCBA pregnancy and an uncomplicated monochorionic pregnancy, provided they are doing the follow-up as per recommendations. But all monoamniotic twins and all, and all complicated MCBA pregnancies and obviously all higher order multiples and triplets and higher, needs to be managed by a fetal medicine specialist in, uh, in conjunction with an obstetrician who has the experience to manage these problems. So coming back to the purpose of triaging, it is to stratify risk to ensure that follow-up is done appropriately, to diagnose some of these problems early and to consider and offer treatment options where appropriate. So what are we triaging for? We are triaging for complications those which are unique to monochorionic pregnancies and some which are common to both monochorionic and dichorionic, such as structural uh, or chromosomal abnormalities. 
And what is unique to monochorionic would be TTTS, TAPS, selective growth restriction, and TRAP. So the bottom line or the foundation stone for all of this is chorionicity. Chorionicity is vital, and this line is often quoted, but unfortunately, even today, we get uh, reports where chorionicity is not reported. There are no twins. There are only monochorionic and dichorionic pregnancies, and it is extremely important as obstetricians that we ensure that when we are sending an ultrasound in early pregnancy, we document whether there is a lambda sign or a T sign and document chorion chorionicity. Once we document that at the 11 to 13 week scan and offer appropriate screening, what else should we be looking for? We need to look for evidence of discordance and we need to look to see if cord insertion sites have been reported. We may not have the ability to document the cord insertion sites ourselves, but the person that we are referring to should tell us where the cords are inserted for each baby and that appropriate screening has been done and that the follow-up is done appropriately. So this is a monochorionic placenta, and you can see that this is where the membrane is inserted. So this is the membrane where you will have one baby on this side and one baby on the other side. This cord is central, this cord is marginal. But if you look at where the placenta anastomosis is, you can see that it is different from where the membrane is inserted. And automatically, when you uh, see that, you realize that only this much of the placenta is going to be supplying this baby, whereas three-fourths of the placenta are going to supply the other baby. And therefore, automatically, it will not be a surprise if this baby is going to be smaller than this baby. And that is the importance of actually knowing what is happening to the cord by looking at the cord insertion, because that decides the placental territory sharing. So the spectrum of problems, as I said, is all of these, and the culprit is in the placenta, in the formation of these anastomoses, and these anastomoses uh, are actually deep in the surface inside the placenta, but what we see on the surface is the dipping down of these vessels, which then join underneath and result in flow from one baby to the other, and when this flow is inappropriate, you have all the complications that can happen. So what should we be looking for? We should be looking to see whether these babies are growing well, whether both bladders are noted, whether the liquor is seen in both sacs, and what is happening to the Dopplers, because ultimately that is what is going to mirror the blood flow pattern. But it's not all about what is happening on the ultrasound. It is important for us to look clinically also at the uterine size, because so many times the mother reports sudden discomfort or between the two weeks, you can see that the uterine size has suddenly gone up, and then uh, uh, patients or women have been referred uh, to pick up problems. So this is the reason for this follow-up schedule. After the 11 to 13 weeks, at 16 weeks, one ultrasound is done, where the Doppler is done along with noting the interferon folding membrane and the site of cord insertion, and then every two weeks, the uh, Doppler is done with the biometry, uh, and a detailed structural scan, which is done at the 20 weeks. So this two weekly follow up is continued all the way through so as to pick up any uh, uh, problem that develops. Whereas in a dichorionic twin, it is enough to follow up every four weekly because here we are not expecting to see those vascular pathologies develop. So twin to twin transfusion is a condition. Uh, which is identified because of discordance of bladder and discordance of lyca, and then staged according to the Quintero system. And the reason it is important to do this is there is treatment possible, but there is definite morbidity and almost 100% morbidity to the twins if the stage increases and these babies are born prematurely. Both babies have the risk of intrauterine demise in twin to twin transfusion, but it does not progress stage by stage, and laser photocoagulation is the treatment of choice. It needs dedicated follow up and it requires appropriate timing of delivery and neonatal care. Besides all the technicalities involved, counseling, setting the stage for expectation, and supporting the couple both emotionally and ensuring they have financial support 
is extremely important. I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, on growth disorders alone, but here in the common question that is asked, because it's very tedious for these mothers to keep going for scans. So somewhere around 26 weeks, they'll ask you, is it still relevant? My babies are growing okay. Should I still go for regular scans? The answer is yes. And if you have somebody who's doing just the umbilical Doppler and the ductus venosus Doppler and saying everything is okay, is that enough? No, it is not. It is important to do the MCA Doppler as well, because that's the only way we can identify this condition called twin anemia polycythemia sequence. So that is another thing that we need to look for. Now the fetal growth in twins in natural course is going to drop off when compared to singleton. But again, here, chorionicity is vital for us to understand how we are going to manage uh, when there is discordance of growth. Now, in a dichorionic twin, the discordance is managed exactly like a singleton. Because here, we are not worried about the risk to the other baby if you have a preterm intrauterine demise from growth restriction of one of a DCDA pair. And in, in an attempt to deliver early and save both babies, you put the normal bigger baby at risk of iatrogenic prematurity. Whereas in a monochorionic twin, because of the vascular compromise, there is a risk of neurological problems if there is a twin demise. And therefore, it is important for us to follow up carefully. There are different types of growth restriction, all based upon Doppler. But the key is not every growth restriction in monochorionic twin requires an intervention or a procedure. This is a baby, these are two babies which we delivered about six years ago, and they're both doing very well. There was almost a kilo's difference in their uh, birth weight. Now, it's not again all about just doing Dopplers. We, as obstetricians, we should not forget the role of CTG when we are monitoring these babies. This was another SIUGR baby, and uh, there was some absent and intermittent reversal of the end diastolic flow that was seen. This, this couple wanted a good day and wanted to wait, so we admitted them, but you can see here that there are unprovoked decelerations happening in one baby, and this pushed the case for actually delivering this baby. So where intervention is needed, you can do selective fetal reduction, but again, this is a decision that needs to be taken appropriately. When there is discordance for anomaly, the management principles are that if there is a lethal anomaly, then uh, we interfere only if the fetus, normal fetus is at risk. I'm coming to the end of the talk. Uh, trap is a very, very rare complication and uh, Again, here you need expert uh, guidance to plan intervention. Chorionicity uh, and gestational age guide the decision for uh, single fetal demise. And I just want to say that any delivery does not benefit the survival, surviving twin, and therefore the decision is to wait. Now, timing delivery in an uncomplicated monochorionic twin is about 36 weeks. Whereas in a DC twin, it's about 37 weeks, and this comes from the risk of stillbirth. In the labor ward, the management involves good teamwork, and the art of obstetrics comes into play because when we are managing the second of twin, often uh, it, uh, we need to have the, our skills for delivering an abnormal presentation intact, and a default is not a cesarean section. So uh, to send, give the take-home messages, majority of twins will do well, but we need to triage to identify the 15 to 20 who will run, percent who will run into trouble. Let's not take the eye off the mother. Let's ensure that chorionicity is assigned early and follow the protocol for the management of those babies. Refer to appropriate centers with experience, time delivery appropriately, and ensure that there's a good neonatal team uh, while we provide emotional support and check the mental health and well-being of this woman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uma. That was, again, an extremely uh, clear talk. Uh, I must say, I have to tell the audience 
that uh, Uma was our student uh, when she was in medical college, when she was in fi finally a medical college. She was Arjun, uh, Arjun student and my student. And uh, she, I, she was so brilliant that uh, I introduced her, we introduced her to my brother-in-law, Arjun's brother. And that's why uh, uh, Uma is part of our family now and part of our obstetric uh, group in the family. So very, very proud of you, Uma. That was a lovely talk. If I may just ask one little question, since uh, you went through that uh, sequence, uh, what exactly are we doing in Chennai for uh, these kind of uh, babies with vascular disorders? Are we are we having uh, any uh, methods that what you are doing with laser? Because you just yeah. kind of skip through it, just so that people who are not aware of what we do have, if you can just talk about it. Yeah. So uh, I think since 2010, actually, we've been doing a petroscopic laser, uh, and I'm. Uh, uh, it, uh, as I said, it's been quite a educational and humbling journey. Uh, Dr. Suresh initiated uh, this, uh, and the procedures are done in our place. Uh, so we've done up till now about 260 procedures, lasers, intra uh, laser for coagulation for twin to twin transfusion, intrafetal laser for trap, RFA and cord occlusion where appropriate for anomaly and uh, selective IUGRs, those who need the procedure. And uh, yeah, so there are, and we have actually uh, learned and also uh, ensured that the procedure is being done in other places also. In fact, um, uh, teams are built in other places as well, and we have handheld other units also. Thank you, Uma. Um, we have uh, another um, session coming up later on in the uh, program for audience interaction. Please do send all your question and, uh, questions either on chat or on the Q&A panel. Uh, please go ahead and do that. This is to all the participants. Uh, now I think we will go on with one of the main events of this Op Progress 2020. Lakshmi, do you want to take over? Unmute yourself, Lakshmi. Lakshmi, unmute yourself, please. So yes. we now move on to the most important and most awaited part of the program as far as Gita and I are concerned, and this is the um, book launch. And for this, today we have two special guests, Dr. Evita Fernandez and Dr. Radhika. I am indeed honored, privileged, and proud to introduce Dr. Evita Fernandez, the chairperson of the Fernandez Foundation, Hyderabad. The Fernandez Hospital was started as a small one by her parents with the vision to provide high quality and compassionate care to all women, and it has now grown into the present size consisting of three hospitals, a school of nursing, uh, and provides excellent and evidence-based respectful maternity care to all women, just maternity care to uh, women in labor and women with gynecological problem. And what is more, the, the hospitals are not run for profit. She has mentored several obstetricians and gynecologists who now work with her and practice the same kind of ethical uh, medicine that she has always stood for. I have personally visited her hospital and have been absolutely awed by the by the infrastructure, by the care given there, the dedication of the um, the doctors, and of course the affection they all have for Dr. Evita. Dr. Evita then shifted focus to uh, training midwives to raise their level to international uh, level of care because she strongly believes that uh, midwife-based maternity care is what uh, is required in countries like ours, and this reduces the unnecessary interventions and definitely increases the chance of natural uh, childbirth. 
The Fernandez Foundation, along with the state government of Andhra and UNICEF, has launched certification courses for nurses from the state health care system. Dr. Evita is an excellent speaker and a sought after one. And we, um, the way we met is in one of, I think, the progress session. And subsequently, I have met her in several conferences and meetings. She, we are, she is a, a very good friend, an excellent human being, a very, very lovable and a loving personality. Geeta and I are very happy and honored, Dr. Evita, to have you with us for the launch of this. Geeta, over to you. Geeta? Yes, one second. Sorry, I, uh, can you hear me? I just lost yes. the button. Yeah, okay. So I am deeply honored to introduce Dr. A.G. Gadhika who is a transplant from the south to the north. She um, was chosen for this because we felt that we needed somebody with the gravitas to honor us by releasing our book. As, I, as all of you know, I am passionate about evidence-based medicine. And I thought there could be nobody more perfect for this than Dr. A.G. Radhika, who obtained her medical degree at Maulana Azad Medical College in Delhi. So she has stayed, but she's a transplant to Delhi. And uh, that also makes her special because I also was uh, uh, in Delhi for a very long time. She did her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University College of Medical Sciences and has stayed on in that same uh, uh, college. Uh, she is very passionate about evidence-based medicine, and she works with the Delhi Health Services, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. She has focused on evidence-based medicine and how to employ it in places like, low resource places like India, and that, I think, is one of the most important pieces of work that anybody can do. Uh, we are a very, uh, as far as India is concerned, we have so, uh, so much dichotomy between the private sectors, the uh, public sectors, the rural areas, and the urban areas. And unless we are able to use evidence-based data across the board, Across India, we would not, we will not succeed in bringing down our mortality rates, both maternal and infant. And I think Radhika has done a great amount of work on this. And all of you also know that the Cochrane database is extremely important. And Radhika has been working with the Cochrane uh, uh, collaboration. She's also a member of the Campbell collaboration. And as, as I said, she is a representative for the guidelines for the international uh, network, particularly for low and middle income countries. She has won uh, many, many awards. Her recent awards were, uh, for was the ICOG Visiting Professor Award in 2019. She has won the Foxy Korean Award in 2019, uh, Foxy Best Paper in 2016. Uh, more importantly, she has uh, she is heading the research uh, wing of uh, ACO, uh, sorry uh, of Foxy, and that I think is extremely important because we need to bring in the culture of research into this country in a big way. Radhika, it is such an honor to have you here to release the book. I would now request uh, Dr. Evita to release uh, by opening the book. And I request all the uh, participants, the faculty members to keep your books ready. Uh, Dr. Evita, can you undo the ribbon? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah.
that was a normal delivery that was a natural delivery <laughs> rita now uh, radhika can we have the same thing can we have you release the book please yeah so this is already delivered so i just need to cut the cord <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so Sorry. that's nice so here we go all of us have our books here yes <laughs> can everybody just hold up their books please yeah well this is instead of a photograph that we would have otherwise taken with all of us standing on the stage with a book at least something in lieu of that corona time abhi <laughs> abhi please take the screenshot yes please please that let us know Sorry, done. Thank you so much. Thank great, you. great, great, great pitch that we have. Thank, Thank you. you, Lakshmi. You want to invite uh, Dr. Evita? Now, can I ask you, Dr. Evita, to uh, speak to us? And the following is Dr. Radhika. You might um, also tell us a few things. Yes. I hope you both have, I mean, received the book. Yes, and uh, also had some time to go through it. and um, we would certainly like to hear from you thank you thanks a lot thank you thank you uh, lakshmi and deepa uh, to begin with congratulations uh, for progress 2020 of listening to all the lectures and i think it will be fascinating and congratulations for the book second edition of essentials of obstetrics within 5 years wonderful Of course, I had to read the book. Of course, I had to flip through it. I was delighted. You know, uh, the, it, it's a whole different format. I'm not talking about the font and the colors and the things, but the fact that you introduce some new things in there. Uh, I was drawn. I mean, to begin with, you're a book passionate about teaching, sharing, excellent clinicians, very sound with your concepts. and of course the fact that you point you know put all the evidence based practice i loved your clinical implication even in your first chapter on anatomy really i loved your practice point and i was particularly impressed when you spoke about the need for a chaperon as a male obstetrician examining a female patient i mean very very uh, minor details and Respectful care was a common thread running through all the books. Competency-based learning, brilliant. Because that's something I learned through my journey in medical training, and we found it absolutely useful. Case-based learning, and your key points: self-assessment. My God, I'm so envious of the students who are going to read this book. I wish I was a student all over again. And the other thing, exhaustively research, reference. You don't need to go all over the place for guidelines. I have to congratulate you two ladies, and it's such an honor that you've given me a privilege to help you launch the book at Progress. Thank you so much, and I look forward to more and more editions. All the best. Thank you, Kavita. From Thanks. you, that's really a great honor. Thank you. Hi, I'm very happy. I want to thank you for being so kind with your introduction. Actually, I was embarrassed. Thank you. Hello, <laughs> Dr. Radhika. Can I request you to say a few words too? Yeah. So, very good evening to all, and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lakshmi, Dr. Geeta, for having me here, for inviting me to do the honor. I'm. It's a great privilege, honor, and. uh you've been you know i've sat through the uh, lectures and uh, progress 2020 uh, i had heard of this earlier i never attended this before but today i know why uh, it carries such uh, you know heavy uh, importance and uh, weight to the especially among the students because uh, people used to from delhi want to go and attend progress at that time i didn't know i didn't know who dr geeta was you know so when i got a call from you uh, regarding the launch of this book i was very pleasantly surprised and felt extremely proud to be associated uh, with this event and um, regarding the book uh, i uh, had told you earlier 
I was introduced to this uh, first edition, you know, to this book right from the first edition, and that was about two years back. And uh, the Association of Organ Gynae uh, Society, uh, Delhi, the office was uh, in, with our department. And incidentally, I was the uh, organizing chairperson for the skills. You know, we started the skills program because we thought now residents find it difficult for, you know, uh, having uh, hands-on experience with increasing the PGC. So uh, when I saw this book, the, the, the first edition, I was so pleasantly surprised. Uh, you know, it was uh, told to me that it is for undergraduates, but no, I thought it was so important to have the fundamentals right, and it was equally applicable for the postgraduates too. So uh, we had this uh, program of having a quiz at the end of each schedule. We had six uh, workshops, and um, I gave away these uh, books as prize, and they were so happy to receive it. In fact, I asked Walter Kruger to provide me with more chapters, more books, so that you know, I could give it away, and uh, people treasure it even today. And now the second edition is absolutely, uh, I, I would say, it is ultimately the thing that anybody would like to have because of the beautiful schematic diagrams. And uh, I would say pelvis is something that I think will remain uh, an enigma till uh, I become old and you know pass away because it is so very difficult to understand anatomy followed by the medical disorders and all that very nicely and lucidly put in the book. And what I best like is, other than the fact that there are good practice points, you have also given what not to do, you know? So it's, a, it's a, I think, a great way to uh, give away the message. Uh, good to know what is to be done. Also very important to, uh, you know, uh, break away from probably certain set uh, protocols which have been followed earlier. So I think uh, it's, it's a really a very nice readable book. And uh, what I find, uh, see, there is a big difference between uh, North and South, East, West, like we all know, huge diversity of teaching, language, everything. So children in North sometimes find it difficult to follow English. You know, they, they find it very difficult to sometimes uh, read English uh, books. And they prefer Indian authors because of the language, easy to understand which is very much the case in this book. And uh, like Dr. Evita has very rightly put, uh, the evidence which has been added, the, 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 the entire uh, package is so informative. And uh, I think if you've done a great, uh, you know, uh, present, present to the, uh, the medical students and the postgraduates and the undergraduates. So thank you so much for having me here. And uh, many congratulations, and I wish this book many more uh, years of success and I'm sure you'll come up with many, many new editions with further development. So uh, thank you so much. So uh, I would also like to know whether there is a electronic form of this book available because I'm sure many of the people would be very curious to know and would like to have it too because today that seems to be the, you know, the game. People uh, just like to have the e-book and carry it along with their apps and all that. So in, that, in case it is there, we would all like to know, know about it. Yes, yes, it's available. I'm sure the publisher. Okay. Even the previous edition is available, and this would soon be made available. It's available on Kindle. It's available on Kindle, and it's available. It's available. On it's available. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that's really nice. That's, that's yeah. great. So, so thank you so much, and it's been a great honor to be here. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Lakshmi, you want to invite Saravanan? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, now, Mr. Saravanan from Walter's Club will tell, speak to us or tell us all something about the book, his perspective uh, from the publishers and the marketing person's point of view. Mr. Saravanan, you're around? Yes, uh, sure, ma'am. Yes, please. yes, yes. Uh, so uh, a very warm good evening to all the wonderful people present here in the uh, Progress series of Open. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce the iconic book, uh, The Essentials of Optimistic Second Edition, by your esteemed authors, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Shashwadri and Dr. Geeta uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Evita Fernandez and Dr. A.G. Radhika for officially launching them. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the famous author, Beverly Clary, says that if you don't see the book you want on the shelf, write it. 
I think this must have been the starting point to the authors when they started writing this book. Uh, we published the first edition of this book in the year 2015. Uh, in its first edition itself, the book established a very strong presence in the market. Uh, it was very well received by the faculty and students. They felt a refreshing change from the already available books in the market. As Dr. Rashmi Shashadri informed us uh, at the start of the session, the, very, the first edition of the book was also timely launched during the progress event of that year. And very coincidentally, we are launching the second edition also in yet another progress. So why the OOT is special? In this edition, as with previous edition, each chapter has been thoroughly revised to include the latest scientific advances and more importantly, clinical recommendations. Uh, the new refreshing format and improved fine-tuned visual elements make the book uh, an easy and enjoyable read. I must say that the much appreciated feature of the first edition continues in this edition too. For example, the cases at the start of the chapters, uh, the summary boxes at the end of each topic, uh, the easily reproducible illustrations, uh, the management flowchart and so on. In its updated edition, the book now conforms with the competency-based medical, medical curriculum. Uh, and it goes one step further in preparing students for the lead examination. The book aims to serve as a textbook for undergraduate medical students from our past experience of the first edition. We can say that postgraduates too will find it as an excellent resource to strengthen their foundation in obstetrics. With this, I would like to uh, hand over the session to Dr. Lashmi Shashadri and Dr. Gupajan to speak about the special features of the book. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Saravanan. Um, well, if you what I think about the second edition of aesthetics, I would like to say, uh, yes, the very fact that bringing out second edition means uh, was edition was received. This has had a gestational period of um, over that. We have a few hiccups uh, which were all uh, promptly attended to and sorted out by one uh, uh, labor was by Waters Kluver because they said we've had uh, enough of waiting for your person, so come on, get it out. There were a few variable decelerations in labor because we changed font size and uh, remove a few boxes, etc. Want to where it? We also had a lot of accelerations. Because all of them looked very good. The diagram came out to be turned out actually, all of and the accelerations were very noticeable. Delivery with an app car of ten, and so here we are launching the book. The unique features of this book that everybody talks about, and which uh, Sarvan and also highlighted. Were all introduced in 2010 in the Essentials of Gynecology, and they were received so well by the students. And the feedback we got about these features was excellent. And there, we decided to continue them in the Essentials of Optics. It all like the students both the books. Uh, you know, it made it so much easier for them, and um, uh, and that's that's very important, uh, especially for undergraduate students. And so all these summary boxes, the tables, the flowcharts, the key points, everything has been continued in the second edition as well. And we have added, as Evita pointed out, practice points, which actually gives the, the clear do the and don't guides them. We have both updated all the guidelines and recommendations, and we want that some of the international uh, guidelines and recommendations for Probably are applicable. There are WHO and FOXY guidelines that are modified these, and um, these have been included with a lot of care. And also, Indian statistics have been given so that it is easy for the students who are studying in. Uh, it's, it's important. So, competency based curriculum is something. 
MCA introduced a few years ago and have been the mantra now. And uh, this refers to competency and knowledge of just not just the theory of every topic, but also competency in communication, in counseling, in performing various procedures and managing the complications. We have made sure that these in every topic. And we have, expected, we have actually highlighted the, the um, questions uh, in the competency based questions that are given in the competency based curriculum at the end of each chapter. All over the world, we also found that there was a lot of concern expressed about the insensitive treatment of women in labor. So, a chapter has been added about which actually Dr. Geeta will be speaking to us. Uh, now, now over to Dr. Geeta for um, her idea for particular edition means to us. Geeta? Yeah, can you see the slide now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. So I'm just going to say a few things because, especially because these are, um, sorry, it's not moving. Just hold on. Yes. So basically, we looked at, we thought about what a medical student really wants from a book. And for anybody, who is learning, especially being introduced to obstetrics for the first time, visual learning is extremely important. So we have paid a lot of attention to the diagrams. We have thought about it. Every part of the diagram we have looked, made sure that it is easy, and there are no ambiguities in that. We have provided these kind of diagrams. Again, simplified them, which the student can look at and say, yes, this is how it works, and made it absolutely clear because Visual learning, especially the children of this generation who are always faced with so many visual uh, prompts, they really love this. We have made sure that we have provided diagrams, we have provided photographs, we have made it easy for them to understand some even complex uh, technology. We have really uh, focused on algorithms because just before the exam to quickly go with the uh, algorithm, it is so easy to go through these things. Uh, we have, as I said, examination preparation is so important for students because the ultimately for an undergraduate student or a postgraduate student, ultimately they have to get through the exam to, uh, uh, you know, that's why a textbook is important. So what we have done is for revision, we have provided these boxes. As uh, Lakshmi said, she first introduced them in uh, Essentials of Gynecology, and they are so popular with students because they quickly go through the box, which encapsulates whatever has been uh, given in the text, and they can go through it, and they can remember the most important points. We have given self-assessment, these case-based questions. We start off with a case at the beginning of the chapter, and then we give the answer. So it's not just a clinical prompt, but it's also a way of understanding the chapter as it, uh, as it has uh, been read. Memory aids are important, and therefore key points uh, at the end of the chapters have been you know, summarized, and we have spent a lot of time making sure that they understand the specific key points that they should focus on in that particular chapter. And most importantly, once you're done with your undergraduate or your postgraduate uh, training, you have to know what is the clinical application of all that you have studied, and therefore, we have given practice points. And these practice points are, you know, right there, very easily uh, seen. And as uh, um, uh, Radhika said, we have talked about practice points which are good that you have to do. We have also given practice points which you should not be doing. There are so many uh, things that people have been doing for a long time without any evidence 
And we have put specifically across saying that this practice point is something that you should not be doing. So ultimately, we have uh, realized that for a student, there are certain things that are extremely important and that we have made sure that they um, that they are able to uh, you know uh, look at these things and learn a lot from this uh, book. Right. So if I can get back to my, uh, I've lost the whole. Yeah. Go ahead, Lakshmi. All right. Now. We the um, on the book launch, and so we need to move on to the uh, academic sessions that are awaiting us. Uh, to the next speaker is none other than Dr. Geeta Arjun, um, somebody whom I have known for the last um, three decades, actually because I have been uh, part of the progress series. As she said, we met in CMC in 1990. That was the first time that we met, and therefore it is, it is exactly uh, three decades. And uh, our friendship has, and association has continued. She has just not been my co-author, uh, but has been my friend, philosopher, and guide uh, as we went through this difficult or not so difficult journey of writing this book. The two of us have fought tooth and nail on various issues. We have then mellowed down and discussed, made up. If it were not for Corona, we would have probably kissed and made up. Uh, Lakshmi, you're muted. Lakshmi, you got muted. Lakshmi, okay. you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So we have gone through this journey together. And uh, if I write, complete something at 1 a.m. and I look up, I'll find that Geeta is still online and she's, she's sending me a new chapter or something, some new reference or whatever. We've, we've absolutely enjoyed working together and uh, bringing out. Uh, I'm unmuted. I'm unmuted and, and coming out with this book. She is very, very passionate about respectful maternity care, and she's now going to speak to us on that pet topic of hers. And um, um, when Gita speaks to us, you can be very sure that the topic is very well researched, very evidence based, and will and is definitely delivered very forcefully with a lot of take home messages. Gita, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you for the sweet words. Right. I'm going to start now. This is a topic very close to my heart, and I have always felt that women come to us in labor, and we need to treat them with kindness and compassion. There are many, many uh, voices being raised now against the disrespect and the abuse that women are getting in labor, and we have to now learn to listen to their voices. I truly believe and, uh, that our book is the first textbook, in, at least in India, which has introduced a big section on respectful maternity care along with the chapter on normal labor. Because we both, uh, Lakshmi and I, have believed that empathy and compassionate, uh, compassion are the hallmarks of an obstetrician and should be the hallmarks of an obstetrician. And therefore, respectful maternity care is something that we should continue to provide. The thing is, we also, it's a question that we have to ask. Why are women in labor treated with disrespect? It, it, this is something that always worries me because particularly in India, the caregivers in, for women in labor are mostly women, the nurses, the midwives, the obstetricians. Yes, there are some fantastic uh, male obstetricians also, 
but the the whole the majority are women and i always wonder why do women disrespect women you would think that women would be the ones who would be the ch who would champion these women who have come to us uh, for our care who are the women at highest risk highest risk for abuse in in labor adolescent girls young girls who do not know how to demand attention uh, women from a low socioeconomic class who have been beaten down by life who think that whatever is given to them is something that they have to accept without question unmarried women are treated badly uh, particularly in this country because of our culture women from ethnic minorities migrant women who are caught in a city or a, a town where they do not even speak the language the local language women living with hiv and this is something which goes on as far as violence against women in labor is concerned it goes on not just in india it's global it's a global issue and it has been become a very major uh, topic right now because recently in 2013 dr varun patel who was an intern in a pune hospital really attracted a huge amount of attention most of it anger anger and uh, uh, people were just so angry with him especially obstetricians because in his blog he wrote that in an indian government hospital giving birth to a child is not a unit less than suffering third degree torture in jail instead of yelling or screaming or shouting at an intern for speaking the truth we have to introspect we have to look at ourselves and see what is it that created this kind of a statement because now women are definitely finding their voices uh, activists uh, are talking to women Act there is activism from women who have gone through labor who have gone through this whole process of childbirth and women Uh, and the media has picked up on this and definitely attention is being focused on doctors and wonder, uh, people are wondering all globally why uh, women in labor are not treated well and it is time now it is not too late for us to hear their voices i know as a as a medical student as an intern when i was going through my training i was it was very common to see abuse in the labor room uh, not just physical abuse but emotional abuse and it just you know it was very heartbreaking for me and we have to learn to listen to the voices of these women i demand to be treated with respect we can't get past this we know that women deserve it and we have to provide respectful maternity care empathy in pregnancy in labor is something that we absolutely have to have and for this we have to change the culture we have to start very early we have to start at the time when these children are going through uh, young students are going through training and we have to start giving them this responsibility because it is a basic human right to receive a childbirth experience that is positive a woman should leave the labor room knowing that she had done she has achieved something it should be evidence based the care that we give should be evidence based it should be equitable it does not matter whether the woman is poor or rich we have to give the same kind of care it should be compassionate and most importantly it has to be respect evidence based maternity care i believe if you have protocols and processes in place in your department you will give the best care but unfortunately there is a no do gap uh, uh, everybody attends conferences everybody reads but what you know does not always get translated to practice and that gap has to be diminished we talk a lot about dying with dignity but why don't we talk about laboring with dignity you know as soon as a woman enters the uh, labor room she could be an a phd she could be an executive who can hold her own in a, a room full of men she could um, you know, be a homemaker who takes decisions every day about her in-laws about her parents about her children 
She could be a, a woman with authority, but the minute she enters the labor room, the caregiver's authority, authority and decisions take over, and the woman is stripped of all autonomy in the labor room. She does not have a say in what can be done. And in 2018, the WHO brought in recommendations which said intrapartum care, that is care during labor for a positive childbirth experience. And they said we have to ensure that women not only survive childbirth, it's not just enough to say, oh, she went through it and she has come out alive, but she must have a sense of control through involvement in decision making and which leaves the woman with a sense of personal achievement. That's something that we have always uh, worked on in our hospital, uh, where we have said, ask the woman at the end of the pro process, how do you feel? How are you happy? Because that's what they should leave with. It's not just the happiness of having given birth, but of happiness of having gone through the process with her uh, dignity intact, with her control intact, and her happiness intact. We know that there are two Indias. There is an India, the corporate India, where you can literally uh, buy the compassion, buy the uh, comfort, and where you are almost, not always, but you can be guaranteed a certain amount of respect because you can afford it. But then there is the other India where uh, women in labor have to, women, uh, pregnant women have to share beds, they have to lie on floors, and we have to think of that also. We must remember that we cannot just have smiling nurses in private hospitals. We must have nurses who have compassion and empathy in every part of uh, India and every hospital in India. For this, the Indian government, the National Health Mission, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government of India, has introduced Lakshya, which is Labor Room Quality Improvement Initiative. And I think it's an important and a very good step because it has been shown that substandard quality of care, which includes disrespectful and abusive behavior, is a significant factor leading to maternal morbidity and mortality. Voices have been, are being heard from around the country. Physical abuse, it seems to be rampant. I lay there as quietly as possible, too scared to make a noise because then the nurse shouted at me and slapped me. Non-consented care. For cesarean section, they only take signatures from the husband saying that the operation will be done. They do not tell the woman the details. The pregnant woman is not told anything. Non-dignified care. We have to maintain her dignity through a very, very traumatic and very difficult life path. <laughs> These are all actual statements uh, uh, have been obtained from women who went through uh, labor and discrimination. Discrimination happens because either because they're poor or they are uh, somebody uh, who cannot afford to open her mouth. Uh, so that is something that we have to fight uh, against. <laughs> But the language is so vulgar, they say, yes, what do you want to do? They say, yes, we will 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 say, yes. All her life, that woman will remember the obstetrician who treated her so badly. As Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you exactly said, or people will forget what you actually did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. If you're kindness, if you're kind, even if they don't understand what procedure you're doing to them, if you have kindness, if you have empathy, they will remember that all their life. Otherwise, they will feel miserable every time they think back on that uh, experience of theirs. Abandonment, abandonment of care is something which is so frightening. Um, my good friend Subhashri uh, has written this uh, booklet on dead women talking. talking. Uh, which is a report on maternal death. And this particular chart is about a, a fourth gravida who uh, died four days after she st first started uh, tre uh, seeking treatment. She went to a hospital, came back, 
went again, um, went traveled 60 miles and then went to so many different hospitals and those so many different institutions. But in the end, after her last visit to a hospital where she was so sick, she had to come back by by bus 50 kilometers, auto for 75 kilometers, came home and ultimately died. Okay, so abandonment of care in any of the institutions, if one obstetrician had taken her case and decided to help her out, she might still be living. So the question is, in such crowded situations, people say, why do you blame us? We are working so hard that the crowds are unbelievable. We are not able to handle it. I'd like you to listen to this. In response, hospitals blame overcrowding, inadequate infrastructure, staff shortages, work pay, and work stress. Given these constraints, can health facilities be committed to providing respectful maternity care? Here's an example of a hospital with a difference. The Kamlan Medical College in Aurangabad which sees between 50 to 60 deliveries every day. Last year, over 17,500 deliveries were conducted at the hospital. At the outpatient department for pregnant women, there are no queues, no care. <laughs> Soft music plays on. The staff is courteous and the workflow well organized. छोटे उम्र के डॉक्टर हो गए तो मेरे को वो बेटा करके कॉल कर रहे थे तो वो मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगा और जो वर्कर्स हैं जो ये सिटिंग टेबल पे जो जो सब बैठे हुए हैं वो बहुत अच्छी तरह से बात करके मुझे बता रहे थे अब आप भी आ जाओ एक घंटे बाद आपको आना है ये सब अच्छी तरह से बात कर रहे थे � Separate cubicles for examining pregnant women provide privacy. Patients are provided chairs. Senior doctors counsel them, maintaining eye contact. So when we say that uh, big uh, hospitals cannot provide uh, care, it has to come from the top. In Aurangabad, a hospital where they can do 17,500 deliveries a year, if they can uh, put in the, all the, the Laksha goals, and they can actually provide this kind of care, putting in uh, uh, birth companions with the uh, mother in labor. It can be done in every hospital in this country. It is not lack of resources, it's a lack of a common will that allows this abuse to continue. So we have to change the culture. And the change, as I said earlier, has to come from the top. I remember when, we, when I was a young student, you know, we always used to have, at least my memory of it, a tough chief who used to yell at the assistant who would throw up his hands and he'll yell at the senior PG who would then call and yell at the junior PG who will then take out all her ire, all her anger on the junior most intern in the, uh, in the ward. And ultimately, who suffers is the woman in labor, the woman who is giving birth. So it has to come from the top. We have to learn to be kind to each other before the youngest person in the team will learn to be kind to the patients. This sensitivity training has to start early. We have to teach them communication skills, and we have to start right in medical college from the third year, from the first clinical year, we have to start it. Because humane and respectful approach to the laboring woman in, involves very small things. We have to greet the mother with a smile, not a frown, not be the chief or the big person. We have to introduce yourself, give your name. There is no prob problem about that. Be calm and polite. Use the respectful form of address. You can say, uh, instead of saying ni, you can say ninga. Instead of saying tu, you can say ah, even if the woman is younger than you. Listen to the woman as she expresses herself. Explain briefly what will happen next. Be kind and gentle during pelvic examinations and keep her covered. Even an old sari, you can't have her lying half naked in the middle of a big ward. So you have to also explain to her about any procedures that you're doing. And comfort during delivery is important. We have to have delivery tables with padding, not on a hard surface. Some privacy, a birth companion, and clean toilet facilities. Labor companions are extremely important in uh, anywhere in the world, 
and it has been shown to increase the rate of spontaneous vaginal birth. It can be anybody, her, her sister, her mother-in-law, her mother, her friends, her neighbor, anybody, decreases the chance of cesarean birth, it cha the chances of instrumental vaginal birth. And in our hospital in, uh, in E.V. Kalyani Medical Center from 1981, we have had uh, husbands in the labor room and it does not matter what level of education they have, they were in the labor room, they helped the uh, mother to go through uh, labor and it's a very important. Just remember that all women deserve respectful maternity care and this is something that we can never, never uh, forget. It has to come from policy, policy change from above, from the administrative side. We have to have caring of, uh, towards parent, uh, patients, and this has to come with training and commitment of, uh, to women, which is a lifelong commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we will go on to the next part of our program. Thank you, Deepa. That was really a wonderful, wonderful speech. That was that was really great. I think even though it was not focused on, um, say, uh, multiple pregnancy or hypertension or uh, uh, corona, I think this is what we obstetricians and the students now need very, very badly. It was so well put across and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I think there is a lot of take home message in it and I do hope that the present generation of obstetricians and students will understand what you are talking about, the, the, the fervor and the passion with which you were talking about this whole, I mean I think it should certainly mean something to them and I do hope they put this into practice. I really want to say you know, um, absolutely. Thank you to you. Okay. So I'm now going to introduce uh, our next speaker, Bijoy Balakrishnan. Again, uh, Bijoy is a person very close to my heart. Uh, he also started, uh, I met him at one of the conferences that he had uh, organized, saw him as a very brilliant, very passionate obstetrician. Uh, and I said he must be somebody who has to be put on the national stage and he came on to progress and now you cannot get him that easily. I was so surprised that he could spare himself for progress 2020 because he is in demand everywhere, nationally and internationally. He is uh, an MS and ONG and he is the head of the fetal medicine unit in Saimar in Puchin since 2007. Uh, he has uh, done so much work in metals, fetal metal medicine, that uh, I have always uh, turned to him when I myself have some doubts. And today he is going to talk to us about fetal growth restriction. And it's not just all about fetal growth restriction. I wanted him to specifically focus on how do we identify the fetal, uh, sorry, the growth restricted fetus, which will ultimately face problems. How do we choose that baby and make sure that that baby is delivered before it gets into trouble? The joy. Me? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes sir, I you audible, sir. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I'm trying to share my screen, but uh, not active. No, no, sir, it is active. Just try it again. Yeah. At the bottom and the lower part. Yeah, it is. I mean, <laughs> it's an issue here. I have just given you the presenting okay. rights. Yes. Just click on the icon and it will show you, it'll ask you to open an app, which you have already opened. No, it's not, it's not open. Just take your time. Yeah. yeah. There's a network issue, I think. So can you see the share the icon yes, on the... Yes. Yes, now it has come on. I think that my network is kind of slow. I'm sorry about this. Yes. No, sir, but I think now it's been now being put up on the screen itself. We can see your screen if you'd like to start sharing. Yes, sir. I'm I'm on second. No problem. Take your time. Take your time.
is my presentation seen uh, so sir it's coming up now it's saying starting to share but uh, it's not visible right now okay can you please unshare it just now and share it again try to share it again okay So can you unshare your content? Uh, okay, one second. How do I unshare this? Yes. Yes, we are. You are on. One second. Joy. Yeah. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. You can see the screen, sir. No, uh, but I can't see right now. One second. It's raining crazily here, and I think that's why the network is. Uh, uh, oh. Sir, would you mind? Uh, if you have email ID, you can share. You can email it to me. I can share it from my end. Uh, I I didn't get it. What do I do? So if you want, I can text you my email ID. Then just send it to me, uh, and I can try to share it from my end. But try to do it again, like because it was just visible now. For us, it is visible right now. It is okay. Yeah, it is, but it's not like functioning Vijay. right. It's just a front page. It is there. Vijay, share icon right now. One second. I'll just can I just log out and log in again? Is that okay? Yes. Go ahead. Don't log out, sir. Try to share it again. Just try to share it again. Icon is now gone blank. It's not coming on. Uh, Doctor Bhikwa, uh -huh. I have a suggestion. You can just switch off your video. Yeah. And then your available network would be stronger. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, but the share share option is not working. Oh, sir, it's working now. It's starting to now. He's given it to you again. The uh, joy. Try again. I must say this reminds me of uh, the early times of progress where we switched from regular slides to uh, digital <laughs> slides and we were using computers. The very first time we used a computer, completely switched to computers. And uh, the day of the conference, I woke up at 4.30, turned on my computer. Everybody's slides was on my computer. That is just the postgraduates who are going to be presenting. And my computer crashed. And I just was in such desperation. And then uh, between Arjun, my children, they all got together. They worked on it. I went to uh, the hall, started the conference, and then they came with the uh, slides. They came with the computer. And certainly, they were not, the computers were not that fancy at that point. Uh, but I, I know what happened at that that day, all the slides worked for the women on our progress team, and it did not work for the men. So I think there is something about computers. I suggest that uh, I have just emailed, I just texted you my email ID. Just try to send it to me so I can click from my end. It should not take much time like this. So, can we then go on with the, uh, while that's happening, shall we go ahead with the panel discussion? Yes, ma'am, sure. I think I should recommend that. Lakshmi? Lakshmi, yeah. 
Uh, if you introduce all the, can you press, uh, give her the sharing rights now, Ravi? Can you switch it to her? Now, let us move on to the next session while Vijay is sorting out his uh, problem, um, which I'm sure will be sorted out in the next five minutes. Don't panic, Vijay. Uh, this is a panel discussion or, on a very common uh, but a problem, common problem, but one with many, many controversies. Because many of us, uh, whether we are teachers or students, are usually left wondering when somebody with multiple pregnancy losses actually comes to our clinic. Uh, more often than not, you will find that there is no particular cause identified, and the, the, all that we can actually do is to reassure her and tell her, um, that this may not happen again, and the chances of it happening again is very, very small, etc. And one and more, we also have to deal with the emotional aspect of this woman as well, somebody who has had um, several pregnancy losses. We are going to have two case discussions today. Gita and I are going to moderate it, and to discuss these cases, we have with us uh, some very uh, brilliant, very well-known obstetricians, Dr. Sharmila Ayavu from Trichy, Dr. Manisha Beck, Professor Manisha Beck from CMC Velor, uh, Dr. Painiapan from Sri Ramachandra Institute, uh, Chennai, and Dr. and Professor Murali Dharpai from Manga, from Manipal. Um, if you, all of you are ready, can I just start with the first case? Yeah. My, okay, I haven't got screen sharing. Oh, no. oh, okay, now, okay. That's me, right. you have to introduce them. Their CVs will start coming. Sorry? You have to introduce the panelists, please, with the... I, I just... Did you yeah, have the... Okay. Yeah. No, I don't have. Ravi, could you please Wait put on the... Yeah. Okay, I haven't got, can you please? Yeah, she. Then I will stop sharing. Yeah, okay. Here we have, okay, Dr. Doctor, Professor Murali Dharpai is from, uh, from Manipal, best outgoing MD from, and topper of course in, from Manipal, who he has been with us as part of uh, several of the progress series and I've met him in several other conferences. Wonderful teacher, and I think he has won Best Teacher Awards uh, and uh, in his in, in his institution several times. And um, he there in his talk, the clarity is the most important thing. It's very simple, beautiful slides, and very very clear in whatever he says. So we are very very happy to have you, um, Dr. Murali Dhar. Can we now move on to the next uh, panelist, please? Uh, here is Dr. Sharmila, who I must confess I am uh, meeting uh, for the first time, but then I realized that the world is very small. And she ha my husband happens to know her sister, who happens to be an endocrinologist who was trained in uh, Coimbatore, and then, we, well, uh, of course, we get around to talking, and I realized that um, um, I, I do know her. Geeta has actually heard her in several conferences and meetings, and um, uh, she was telling me about how, again, what an excellent speaker she is. Um, she works in, um, um, she has an MBBA from Coimbatore Medical College, which is where I also uh, come from. I'm an undergraduate from uh, Coimbatore Medical College, too, so that's great. That's, I am just looking at it only now. Uh, great to have you with us, uh, Dr. Sharmila. Uh, we now have uh, Dr. Ma who's the next CV you have? Okay, here we have Professor Pananiyappan. Well, uh, somebody all of us know very well. If there is a meeting, whatever be the conference, if there is something organized in Chennai by the OGSSI, Progress, Trivandrum, Bangalore, Pananiyappan is there. Any teaching session, Pananiyappan is there. Again, a, a wonderful teacher with a lot of uh, clarity with which he um, puts across uh, um, very important uh, aspects of every topic. Handles them very well. 
uh, we know him as a student, we know him as a junior consultant, we know him as a professor now. And uh, uh, welcome, Paniyapan. Uh, great to have you in our panel. He, now, the Dr. Manisha. Yes. Here we have uh, Dr. Manisha Beck uh, from Christian Medical College, Velo. She's a professor now. She joined us immediately after finishing her uh, MD from. Um, uh, where did you do your MD? Bombay. Yes, Manisha. Delhi. Delhi. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, when she came to us, she she was really fresh and raw and all you know enthusiastic, very willing to learn. And I think over a period of time in the last twelve years in uh, we, working with us and working in CMC with after I retired with various other people there. She's really blossomed, uh, taken on fetal maternal medicine, went abroad and trained in it, and she's back now actually heading a unit and again, uh, very um, emphatic and evidence based about whatever she says. And that is what is very good about Manisha. And I'm very happy to have you here, Manisha. Thank you for joining us. Now, shall we get going with the, with the discussion? Okay. Go ahead. Ravi, give her the sharing. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay. Now, without, okay, we'll move on to the first case, which is a 27 year old lady with um, four, four previous miscarriages. We are, not, we are not seeing the Hello? Dr. Ramdi, please see your screen, ma'am. Can you please share it? Sorry? Ma'am, can you please share your screen? It's not been able to. Be I have. Have I not shared it? Let me no. see. No, one sec. No, one sec. One sec. One sec. You've shared it, Lakshmi, but I think you've shared the whiteboard instead of the PPG. Okay. Now where am I? You got it. You have to go on top of your first slide, ma'am. You have to go to the first slide. Okay. Fine. I will go to the. No, this is not the one. This is hypertension. No. Sorry, I think all of us are having teething troubles today. Yes, yes, yes. You have to go on slideshow. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, you're on. Okay, okay. Now, uh, I start with the first, uh, it's the 27 year old lady with four previous miscarriages uh, who came for consultation and evaluation. The miscarriages, the first one happened at nine weeks. It was a missed miscarriage, expelled with mesoprostol. The second one was at six weeks, missed miscarriage again, and um, expelled spontaneously. The third one is at seven weeks, this miscarriage expelled with misoprostol. And the fourth one happened at 14 weeks. Uh, cardiac activity demonstrated to 11 weeks, disappeared later, and expelled with misoprostol. So here's somebody who's had three first trimester losses and one second trimester loss. Menstrual cycles were regular, 5 to 6 by 28 to 30 days. Examination revealed a BMI of 30, milli, uh, 30 per meter square. There was a canthosis, nigricans, and skin tags indicating uh, peripheral insulin resistance. No pallor. Examination was normal. Blood pressure was normal. Pelvic examination was unremarkable. What investigations would you order? I have listed some here pelvic ultrasonography. Parental carrier typing, hypolipid antibodies, fasting and postprandial sugars, and diabetes. Now, shall I start with um, Dr. Paniyapan? What, which of these investigations would you order? Uh, yeah, uh, I think this case looks like a typical case presentation which comes to every one of us and so probably I think I will order a pelvic ultrasonography to know whether she's got a septate or a whatever uh, deformity inside the uterine cavity and outside the uterus. 
definitely parental karyotyping at this point of time because she's had uh, three second first trimester losses and one uh, second trimester. And I would think in terms of APS as well and definitely sugars and thyroid function tests if they were not done before and definitely repeat the sugars again because uh, she typically seems to have uh, insulin resistance, uh, peripheral evidence of that and uh, I wouldn't even um, be wrong uh, in doing a oral glucose test if not fasting and postprandial because uh, definitely this lady is a potential candidate to have diabetes as well. As though she's only 27 but she's obese with a BMI of 30 and so I think I would order all of the tests which you have mentioned here. Um, Dr. Manisha, would you like to comment on this? Would you like to do all of them, some of them? Um, what would you like to do? Dr. Manisha? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay. So as we have already noticed in the case, so this lady has had three miscarriages in the first trimester followed by a loss at 14 weeks. So the initial investigations at this point of time, I would definitely like to do a parental karyotype to look for any balanced translocations in the parent, which could eventually lead to unbalanced translocations in the fetus leading to recurrent pregnancy losses. Antiphospholipid antibodies, definitely yes. Because she, at the, if you look at the history in the last pregnancy, she had a loss at 14 weeks where the fetal cardiac activity was initially seen and then it disappeared. That is the history which is kind of typical for somebody who's had an antiphospholipid antibody system. Then obviously with the history and examination, as you said, there are features of uh, insulin resistance with the gantosis, nigric cancer and all. I would definitely want to do a fasting and postprandial plasma sugars as well. And uh, obviously, when we are doing for all this, thyroid function test is something that usually we check for as, as endocrine dysfunction is common in these women with first trimester miscarriages. And pelvic ultrasound is something that I would not do as a first line, but probably, definitely okay. at a later stage, but at some point of time, I would like to do to look for any dry septum. Uh, thank you. If this lady was not obese, Manisha, would you have still done uh, blood sugars or uh, would you only do it only because uh, this woman looks like a candidate for uh, diabetes? Do you routinely do blood sugars or plasma sugar values in women with recurrent pregnancy loss? So in CMC, what we generally do in our RPL clinic when they come to us with first trimester losses, we do tend to do an HbA1c to see if they are not and uh, if they are not diabetic. And uh, we have picked okay. up a lot, a uh, few of these over diabetes just on the basis of RPL where there were no other features. So we just okay. we do recommend that we do an HbA1c. You would you would anyway do them, okay? So uh, Dr. Murali Dharan and Dr. Shamila, would you agree with these or do you have um, any any different? Uh, would you take a different line? Uh, my order of my. Yeah. Yes, okay, shall I? Dr. Sharmila, would you would do all of them too? And Dr. Murali, my, any my difference? Order of, my order of testing will be antiphospholipid antibodies, ma'am, followed by okay. a fasting and a postprandial plasma sugars. Go on to a 3D okay. ultrasound, parental karyotyping. Okay. I will take a thought on thyroid function test in the case it is so normal. I will not do a thyroid function test. Okay, okay, fine, fine. Okay. Dr. Murali, would you agree or is it going to be yeah. any different? No, no. See, this patient is a case of primary aborter. Like none of her pregnancies went beyond 20 weeks. In fact, she had all had very early abortions. So early abortions okay. usually point towards genetic problem or chromosomal problems. So that's why we have yes. to do this parental <coughs> especially to look for balanced uh, translocations, like uh, Dr. Yeah. said, Manisha said. And antiphospholipid antibodies is also a very important factor in a primary aborters. So that is okay. a must. But as a routine, Fine. usually in a case of RPL, it is important to note that the sugars are under control and thyroid is also under control because we see these concentrated disputed causes. So absolutely no dispute is parental characteristic and antiphospholipid antibodies. Pelvic ultrasound okay. is just a completion. Fine. So you are saying that or most people feel that antiphospholipid antibody, parental karyotyping, yes. Ultrasonography, yes and no, maybe later. Uh, some we want to do it immediately. Sugars, mainly because she is also obese and uh, there is evidence of peripheral insulin resistance and thyroid function test plus minus. Okay. Now, uh, just to, um, you know, um, talk, again, 
explain or talk, highlight why we want to do each of these investigations. Pelvic ultrasonography in recurrent pregnancy loss, we do know structural anomalies can give rise to uh, losses, especially septate uterus, because there can be imperfect decidualization in the septum. But whether it can give rise to recurrent mis miscarriages in the first trimester is not really known because there's no proven association, because every pregnancy need not really implant itself on the uh, septum. And therefore, uh, sporadic ones can happen, but then the recurrent ones are very uh, may not happen with the um, uh, with the septate uterus. Cervical insufficiency has a different clinical presentation, and so we wouldn't talk about it. If the ultrasonography shows any septum, you could go ahead and investigate as to whether it is a biconvate septate, whatever it is, with other uh, subsequent investigations. Parental karyotyping, this particular woman has a very typical presentation, as we said, because it's all in the first trimester, mis miscarriages, and uh, therefore it could certainly be one of um, uh, one of those chromosomal uh, abnormalities. Everybody's talked about a um translocation, and um, please remember that it is much more common to have an associated abnormality in the karyotyping when there are more than uh, three uh, miscarriages and they may also have a family history of recurrent losses or stillbirth especially if other family members have been carriers as well recurrent early trimester mis miscarriages can occur with this antiphospholipid antibody well everybody has agreed upon yes dr murali were you going to say something to highlight with regards to ca parental karyotyping is many a times we send parental karyotyping as normal that is with the usual karyotyping we must insist on now micro array that's where we are now able to see very minute changes and, uh, you know, inversions, deletions, and translocation. So normal karyotyping will almost always show it as normal. And they just talk about 46 uh, and 46 XY and they say it's okay. So that's why I highlight here that we have to ask for a microarray system. Yeah, I thought, um, I mean, at least where we send the samples, we always get a complete report. But, well, in centers, in the lab where they wouldn't do it, you certainly have to specify. It's, a, it's not like you want to know the chromosome number. No, yeah. you actually want to know whether these are, because the number is not going to be altered. The total number of chromosomes are not altered. Right. I point well okay. taken. Yeah, thank you. Now, with respect, anti, with respect to antiphospholipid antibodies, um, I want to know, will you ask for all three antibodies or will you just ask for what is what is commonly done in your lab? Will you treat only if one is positive? Um, these are the two questions that I would like. Uh, Sharmila, would you like to take it? Would you like to answer that? All the three antibodies I would like a report on. And okay. I will definitely okay. treat even if one is a strong one clinical history for RPM. Even if one is positive, she'll need treat treatment because yes, a clinical history, because a clinical history is very very strong. So, and when you have a, okay. a antibody also positive, it's better to go for a treatment. Okay. So, Dr. Pineyapan, most guidelines recommend testing twice to twelve weeks apart. Would you agree, or would you test once uh, or make an exception to this rule? Uh, I mean, generally, yes, the guidelines would say 12 weeks apart, and then some guidelines said we would do it 8 weeks apart, and they also recommended doing it in the same lab. And in uh, Indian scenario, I don't know how much it would be possible, and uh, to get uh, an APS positive value of one test more than 40, then as Dr. Sharmila said, I think I would think in, think in terms of labeling her as an APS rather than repeat it after 12 weeks. Uh, that too, whether in between pregnancy or during pregnancy, then again the controversy comes and then we tend to lose the patient. Yeah. So it is, uh, it is reasonable enough to uh, uh, label her as APS even if uh, one testing comes positive rather than to wait for 12 more weeks and repeat the test again. And yeah, especially this, if she has got a very typical history. Typical history okay. like this. And if the test is more than uh, 40, uh, I mean highly uh, sensitive to that. So not a low value, but high value of uh, antibodies. So that is when I will look at Manisha, would you agree? Manisha? Uh, so if you look at the diagnosis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, the reason uh, why this 12 weeks criteria was set by the Sydney criteria, initially we were following the Saparos criteria where they said six weeks is all right. And then they changed it and made it more stringent to 12 weeks is the reason why, because your anti-cardiolipin antibody levels, they are 
they are they vary the levels vary in a in a in a non pregnant as well as a pregnant individual so the levels are, are not the same so that is the reason why they said it is better to repeat it after 12 weeks this is in contrast to if you have a woman who has got a positive lupus anticoagulant which is unlikely to change even if you were to repeat that test in 12 weeks Yes. So if if your diagnosis although uh, ACA being more than 40 is what is the cut off that is the 99th centile but even if your diagnosis is based on an ACA value which is more than the 99th centile if you have the time and the woman is not pregnant it is always advisable to kind of repeat it after 12 weeks and reconfirm that whereas if it is on the basis of NC and if your the woman becomes pregnant or something like that you can definitely treat it as anti phospholipid antibody yeah we Yeah, we don't have to wait for the 12-week report before we start her on treatment, especially if one has been positive and the woman has come pregnant. But if you have the time and if the patient can afford it, and especially in those where the history is plus minus, it is always better to repeat it 12 weeks later. And especially for the reasons that Manisha mentioned. Now, what are the cutoff values? Everybody has already talked about it. Either more than 40 EPL or MPL, or uh, more than the 99th centile, both are acceptable. And the lupus Anticoagulant is usually an APTT plus or minus. Now, testing for diabetes again, everybody talked about because. But remember that it's only uncontrolled diabetes that can give rise to miscarriage because by the time one or two miscarriages happen, generally diabetes is picked up. An uncontrolled one just that does not go unnoticed for years on end. And um, uh, India is the diabetic capital of the world, and therefore you might test in all of them so that if there are abnormal values and if the woman does get pregnant, you would certainly like to manage her to prevent complications. And in women with high BMI, it's certainly important. But however, this may not be the cause for recurrent pregnancy loss. Is what I want the students to take home as a message. Now, um, even among the panelists, there was a lot of controversy about whether they would do thyroid testing or not. because the association between thyroid function dysfunction and recurrent pregnancy loss there is a lot of controversy over hypothyroidism everybody knows so if the woman looks like she is a hypothyroid of course by all means test but is there an association between subclinical hypothyroidism between thyroid peroxidase antibody and recurrent pregnancy loss you have studies which tell you yes you do have studies which tell you no and therefore there is definitely no definite guideline to say you must do it in all of them they look hypothyroid by all means if they don't you might want to do them so that if they are borderline hypothyroid subclinical hypothyroid you, you could monitor them through pregnancy because in pregnancy the levels of can go up and they may require treatment but you really don't associate it with the actual uh, or uh, consider it an actual cause of recurrent loss Karyotyping, I think all of us have talked. Now, this particular patient, the karyotyping was normal. Pelvic ultrasonography was normal. Antiphospholipid antibodies, lupus anticoagulant was positive. Anticardiolipin was 56 GPL. Beta 2 glycoprotein was 36, kind of borderline. HbA1c was 5.9. Plasma sugar is normal. Ft4 TSH normal. TPO antibodies negative. So we here have a definite diagnosis. she was asked to repeat the test after 12 weeks and the results were positive again so i would like to ask um, murali sir would you start her on folic acid would you start her on folic acid with aspirin will you start her on folic acid aspirin and heparin the diagnosis here is confirmed as anti phospholipid syndrome okay so before i think that uh, i wanted to actually talk about the uh, the test ncl and uh, la and and beta 1 glycoprotein most of the practitioners do these tests when the patient is pregnant which is absolutely wrong that's why i want to highlight so it should be done 12 weeks after the abortion number 1 so if you want to repeat after another 12 weeks that's left to you but here you have repeated that's a good thing to do but the thing is that would make it 6 months weightage so 12 weeks after the previous abortion and repetition after another 12 weeks totally there will be 6 months of waiting so instead of that you can actually uh, start treating if the levels are more than 99 percentile take it as positive so once it is more than 99 percent positive it will be taken now with regards to starting this can aspirin or heparin no, uh, can i uh, can i just if you you said don't do it in pregnancy dr murli but there are many women who come to us 
with this history of recurrent losses and they come to us as soon as they miss their period. In those kind of situations, you will have to do them and uh, take the uh, reports as positive or negative and you don't have time to repeat them 12 weeks no, later. No, 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 is that what you're is, saying? No, I the agree problem is, I would not the do problem it. Is, if you do it in pregnancy, they are naturally high. So you Pita, were you saying something? I agree with Murli, we would not do it in pregnancy. No, but if the woman comes pregnant, first trimester, <laughs> mid period, what will you do? No, you I may choose to treat her empirically, but no, no point in doing the test because they're naturally hurt. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah, the cutoffs would be, uh, would be different. But then the thing is, for want of anything better to do, most people uh, do it while the woman is pregnant and repeat it again for 12 weeks later and then start treatment and, you know, that is how all the, all the confusion sets in. Yes, yes. Ideally, okay, so uh, Murali, you were saying about what you would start her on, folic yeah. acid, aspirin, aspirin what, and heparin. What is the question? Do we start it before pregnancy is the question or during pregnancy? Yes, yes, no, no. She has just come with all this, before pregnancy. pregnancy. She's not before pregnant pre yet, yeah. Okay. yeah. Before pregnancy, there's absolutely no doubt, no doubt about folic acid, all right, that everybody knows. Okay. Now, when Fine. does it start aspirin and heparin before pregnancy? Uh, we mm -hmm. have done a study in Manipal itself. We started one group started before pregnancy, one group started after pregnancy. The problem here is nobody knows when she's going to become pregnant, you know. So how long to give this aspirin and aparin becomes the problem. So most of no, most of us now don't pump before they are pregnant. Only when they become pregnant, we start. As soon as the urine pregnancy test is positive, we will start aspirin. But then last okay. people wait for the pulsations to be seen to start happening. So this has been the practice. Okay. I'll repeat myself. Uh, uh, before okay. pregnancy, aspirin as soon as you miss the periods and heparin after uh, yep. pulsations are Heparin after, okay, when she gets pregnant. Now, the uh, guidelines, some of them, which they have just, uh, I mean, the recent ones say that it is get better to start low-dose aspirin uh, pre-conceptionally in women with early pregnancy losses, especially those under 10 weeks and immediately after, I mean, beyond 10 weeks. Whereas if they have late pregnancy losses, it should be fine to start it at 12 weeks. Uh, these are the guidelines, but as you said, you could start and keep waiting and waiting and waiting and the woman may never get pregnant. And these so are the issues, but it's like, well, yeah, really but the thing is, low-dose aspirin is uh, not going to harm her. And if she had very typical presentation of only early pregnancy loss of more than three, it may be prudent to start it earlier. But, um, you know, I don't think there are large randomized trials saying, should we do this or should we do that? Heparin, of course, is used only after confirmation of cardiac activity. She returned three months later, menses delayed by, th by 37 days, pregnancy test delayed by seven days, pregnancy test was positive, she was on folic acid and aspirin preconceptionally. Would you start her on vaginal or injectable progesterone pineapple? Dr. Pineapple? Uh, audible now? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, on, on this particular patient, I would definitely not start her on any progesterone, whether vaginal or injectable, because I think she's a very clear cut case of uh, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome. So I would uh, think in terms of heparin as soon as say, 37 days, I will think in terms of heart and then probably think in terms of starting heparin, and I wouldn't start uh, injectable progesterone. No, you don't want to give us a substance vaginal tablet? No, 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 uh, no I don't want to give Neither vaginal nor <laughs> okay. injectable. Okay. Uh, Sharmila, would you agree? No, definitely not. No progesterones at all for her. It's only okay. folic acid, so aspirin and heparin. Okay, and heparin, okay. Uh, do the other panelists agree too? Shall I move on? Okay, fine. So, uh, what is the role of progesterone in unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss? We all know that this is an explained recurrent pregnancy loss because we have got a, uh, an investigation or a test which is turned positive. But even in unexplained one, um, recurrent losses, we have, there is a lot of controversy. The PROMISE trial said that it did not improve the outcome. The PRISM trial in 2019 said if there is more than three unexplained, that is the bottom line, losses, it may reduce the risk of miscarriage. Uh, anyway, she was um, 
started on low molecular weight heparin and um, had regular antenatal checkup with close monitoring uh, just to highlight sorry yes uh, in the prism and the uh, uh, promise trial yes agreed absolutely they said no road in the prism trial gave a contradictory opinion and we also had a yeah trial which did say that the two trials the prism and the promise trial started progesteron after the fetal heart and so whereas the other initial trial started progesteron in the luteal phase itself and the pregnancy uh, take home rate yeah. well is better but there were no well, conclusive yeah. evidence and they did not say that you should give progesteron that was not the answer but we also need to keep yeah. it as an unexplained pregnancy loss not in this particular case definitely no and In this particular case, it is a definite no, and I and I completely agree with you. And that is why I put up we could put up two controversial ones because one said yes, one said was in a later analysis. There is later later analysis, and if you get into that controversy, you know that we basically I think the bottom line is it doesn't do much. Though of course everybody wants to use it. That's it is actually okay. far. Now, it is actually pharma driven, ma'am. It's not. Uh, Uh, because yeah. because seen it uh, practically also when you give uh, give for like unexplained pregnancy loss it's not working at all again she loses her pregnancy that's what we see so there's no point in giving yeah. a drug which is not going to work yeah but the thing is uh, the problem is kind of stuck on in the minds of the practitioners and you find that pregnancy loss or no pregnancy loss everybody is on uh, progesterone now anyway i'm not sure whether i want to get into it now treatment options for pregnancy loss i have just summarized it here which all of us actually discussed so how long will you continue the aspirin and low molecular weight aspirin um so yes uh, sharmila would you like to take it how long will you continue it Ma madam she is positive aps syndrome i'll continue till the day she is going to deliver i'm not i'm not going to stop before that and suppose she is so we are going for a, and both aspirin yes, and uh, yes, aspirin yes okay. yes both so and suppose uh, she is going to have imminent delivery then i will stop it because uh, 6 to 12 hours time is enough for low molecular heparin to go off and you will have a better outcome but you keep your uh, blood products ready because you are going to have both the problems of thrombosis and hemorrhage which can happen post delivery also so you keep everything ready for such a case she is a very high okay. risk so you'll have all everything ready before you uh, go for a delivery okay. for her manisha do you agree manisha yeah yeah so there are actually two schools of thought regarding the stoppage or timing of stoppage of aspirin there is one school of thought which okay. believes that stopping it at 37 to 38 weeks and one school of thought which says that continue till delivery but her parent definitely till delivery what would you would like to do in this case yeah. if you continue to delivery you need to know what to do if she bleeds then you need to know no epidural etc yes. etc and there yeah, can be so, complications in labor so would you like to then switch so over if you going to continue till delivery would you like to switch over to unfractionated heparin would that make sense yes i'm this thing like yes yes Yes, so unfractionated heparin at probably 36 weeks is a reasonable reasonable option if you can could perhaps yeah to continue all, okay it's, a, it's it's always a good thing to have these women have a planned delivery rather than coming with coming Imagine. in spontaneous labor and all chaos uh, is there so i think it's good to have okay. a plan on them as far as the baby is concerned okay okay wait would you uh, dr murli would you agree would you stop continue what do you do Aspirin after 34 to 35 weeks and uh, continue okay. LMWH till uh, six hours before the onset of labor, and we restart okay. after. Okay, fine. So this lady con aspirin continued till 36 weeks. Low molecular weight heparin uh, discontinued at 37 and switched to unfractionated, which was discontinued 24 hours before delivered by forceps girl baby. Now the, my yeah. last question yeah. is how. Uh, madam can i ask one doubt uh, when i in my yes. post graduate days we are giving unfractionated heparin and i thought it had a much better effect than the low molecular heparin what is your opinion on that ma'am no yeah, it had, had a much, much better outcome with much unfractionated better? heparin much better outcome with unfractionated heparin compared to no. low molecular weight heparin uh, what is you your know, thought on that ma'am um the there are a lot of advantages to uh, low molecular weight heparin by in the sense that it is a single dose as opposed to two, two twice daily doses and also the um, you know uh, you don't have to monitor it etc you know aptt etc because uh, other problems are there and with respect to with respect to uh, the the effect in recurrent pregnancy loss especially in antiphospholipid syndrome they, they are comparable 
they are definitely comparable. And therefore, now, um, because of the ease of administration and monitoring, people give low molecular heparin, but their expense factor is also there. So, if the patient can afford it, but then uh, we are switching only because it is easy to reverse it using protamine if the patient has a problem. You, she goes into labor before you can, you have the time to stop or in a, uh, something yes. like that. So, uh, I did you have to? Mila, I want to Geeta, uh, ma'am, on to Okay, Geeta. Geeta, what did uh, just one thing, Charmila, you know that all the studies on heparin for uh, antiphospholipid uh, syndrome were done only with unfractionated heparin. The switch happened much later, and it's so cheap that that is perfectly okay. Women can are quite willing to take it twice a day if they can't afford the low molecular weight heparin. Absolutely. I'm not sure about whether it's more effective, but equally effective. I'm asking that question because two editions before Williams Obstetrics came with a, a finding in their APS saying that when you use unfractured heparin, it works much better at the placenta level compared to low molecular heparin. That was seen two editions before. That was no, when I was a postgraduate. There are but no, okay. no randomized no. studies with only low, low molecular weight heparin. All of it is based on these studies in the 80s which used unfractionated, unfractionated heparin. We continue to use unfractionated heparin. I must say that also because I now I mean, work in uh, you know in a secondary level hospital and even in CMC ten years ago we were using unfractionated in many women not because of anything else but because of the cost and the fact that it works perfectly well. I agree with her. But with respect to the efficacy in this particular situation, I don't think there are any head to head comparisons. And at the moment, no one says one is better than the other. So you depend, decide depending on your patient. That, that's probably what people would tell you. The other, um, exa the the other advantage, Matt, the other advantage of using unfractionated heparin is if the woman goes into labor, it is so much easier to reverse the accident. Yeah. Rather yeah, than that's using the low switch. molecular weight. Absolutely. Yeah. So it is definitely, Absolutely. Yeah. You don't have to switch. You don't have to yeah. switch, etc. Now, how long will you continue pineapple? Ma'am, I would continue uh, the low molecular weight heparin after delivery uh, till 12, uh, 6 weeks uh, postpartum and then I will reassess her again uh, on okay. the same she was taking before. There are, I think here again there's a controversy. Some people say that if the patient hasn't had a thrombotic event in the past and it's only for the recurrent, the pregnancy, recurrent pregnancy loss that you're giving it because of the uh, previous history, you could stop it after delivery. But then there are other guidelines which are very definite, especially the NICE says that you should continue it after six weeks postpartum. And I think uh, people follow whichever they want. I think uh, now I will uh, invite Dr. Geeta to take over. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Ravi, can I have the sharing, please? Ravi, I need the sharing. Forgive me. So the next case is on recurrent pregnancy loss due to cervical insufficiency. Um, I just want to sh share a short history. Srimati Vanajakshi Padmanabhan had five second times to pregnancy losses. She wept when she lost her fifth pregnancy at 26 weeks, a fully formed baby boy. With operative intervention by Dr. E. V. Kalyani, she gave to a birth to a son, Ravindra Padmanabhan, who went on to become a famous surgeon. This story is very important in my life because uh, Vanajakshi Padmanabhan was my mother and she had five uh, second trimester pregnancy losses. Dr. E. V. Kalyani, who ultimately I started, uh, I worked with for many, many years. Uh, she is the one who did a surgery on my mother, transabdominal surgery. Unfortunately, she never documented what exactly she did. So that procedure is lost uh, to the world. And uh, my brother was born, and a year and nine months later, I was born. And that is, that is why recurrent pregnancy loss has been very, very important in my life. I would not be here doing Progress 2020 if Dr. E. V. Kalyani had not delivered me. 
and then taken me on as her uh, uh, partner after I came back from the U.S. So we'll start with this lady, Mrs. M.N., a 29-year-old lady with three pre previous pregnancy losses. She came for consultation and evaluation to us. Her history sh said that at eight weeks, she had a at the fourth pregnancy, she had a missed miscarriage at eight weeks. The second pregnancy, she had a PPROM and painless expansion of the fetus at 17 weeks. In the third pregnancy, she had a missed miscarriage and she expelled with mesoprostol. So she had a mixed history. So what could have caused the cervical insufficiency in the second pregnancy? Um, would you like to see that? Do you have any? Other than the panelists, can everybody else mute, please? Thank you. Yeah, probably the dilatation and curettage procedure itself would have caused the damage, and that that may be the reason. So now that she has, you think that you know she the first one was a missed miscarriage. The second was sounded like a, a cervical insufficiency. What investigation? Because she's got a mixed history. What investigations would you order in this case, Charmila? Uh, we would need, need to do all the three which have got a recognized reason. One will be the antiphospholipid antibodies, the second will be the parental karyotyping and the 3D ultrasound. So you need to know whether any uterine anomalies are there, whether antibodies are there or whether she has got a, uh, a problem with her, uh, what do you say, a genetic factor, the parental, because it's a mixed etiology. You cannot go fixed with just cervical insufficiency because after that she again had a, a miscarriage at around nine weeks, I think. So it may be, you, you cannot do one investigation and stop with that and when she loses the next pregnancy, she will be in a suit. So you can do all the three and find out what's happening. So, uh, Pineapple, what would you advise for the next pregnancy before you have done any investigations? Is that second pregnancy loss something that you would have to keep in mind? If the second one is a thought, then I would probably think in terms of uh, cervical insufficiency in her and then probably uh, prime her or uh, counsel her for different options for uh, cervical insufficiency. Probably think in terms of a cervical starting from uh, 12 weeks of pregnancy or even uh, earlier I will tell her that she has to be on some form of surgery or etc. Or maybe at least think in terms of giving her a vaginal progesterone but at the moment I will tell her that her next pregnancy has to be absolutely uh, careful and she needs to come to us at that point of time so that we would decide as, as to what uh, mode of management would be. So, uh, and when she had her tests done, she went obviously to, she had pregnancy losses. She went to several doctors and she had antiphospholipid antibodies uh, done by three doctors in three different labs. And I think that's something we all need to get away from. If you have a, a report from one lab which says they're absent, please accept that they're absent. The parental, the parental karyotyping was normal. And uh, pelvic ultrasound, again, everybody does, does a pelvic ultrasound for anybody with a problem. And one actually even reported it as unilateral PCOS. Just remember, you cannot have unilateral PCOS. You either have PCOS or you don't. Don't. Right. Um, so, uh, Manisha, in this patient, so uh, we have everything. The antiphospholipid antibodies were negative. So, is there any reason to ask for ANA antibodies, antibodies to um, phosphatidyl inositol and phosphatidyl serine? Uh, should you look for tests for inherited thrombophilia? What do you think, Manisha? This kind of pregnancy losses or for any kind of RPL, the, the, the ordering of ANA antibodies and the other tests have not, uh, have not been proven to be a cause for RPL, the association or the causative association has not been found to be robust. Uh, right. Although from some late uh, trimester pregnancy losses, they have said thrombophilias, but again, it is this way that the evidence is not very robust on association. So in this woman, I would not like to order these, uh, these investigations. Right. So because there are uh, labs which offer what is known as a um, antiphospholipid anti panel. And they do everything. They throw in the kitchen sink at this woman and including the fact that her, uh, they do an ultrasound of the purse before they do anything else because all this costs a lot of money. So these are absolutely unnecessary tests. So we know 
Yes, yes, Mudli. Routine testing of women with RPL for inherited thrombophilia is not currently recommended. We must remember that. Um, we reassured her that she should not worry about the two missed miscarriages because we know that with two missed miscarriages, women still have an 80% chance of going ahead and having a normal pregnancy. We, uh, we uh, did tell her to st uh, start on folic acid for her next pregnancy. We told her to proceed with the pregnancy. And we told her that we are going to uh, do a cervical circlage or advise cervical circlage at 12 weeks after confirmation of viability because she's had two mis miscarriages. She returned to her hometown. What is your choice if we are going to uh, now going to do a cervical circlage? What would your choice be, Mudli, for the technique for cervical circlage? What is your choice? What technique would you use for cervical circlage? And what suture would you do for, what suture would you use for the circlage? See, uh, because this patient didn't have actually sufficient time in the third pregnancy, probably I'm sure if she had continued, she would have had a second trimester abortion there also. So definitely it's a case of incompetence. Uh, with regards to the type of circlage, usually you would do one which you are very used or which you are comfortable with. A very high McDonald's circlage is the one which most of the obstetricians are well versed with and that is quite okay for anybody. And since here the patient never had a circlage in the past and which has never failed, there is no need of straight away going for cirrhotcus. And abdominal, very, very few, only I have seen you doing it. <laughs> Nowadays, people are doing with laparoscopy. I have seen few, but otherwise... That. Now, let's, let's just done, be done with this. So, you would yeah. use... So only, yeah, only McDonald's. And what suture would you use? Yeah, you know, marceline tape is the best people think, but we need not do it always with that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Pineapple, what would your uh, uh, choice be for suture for circlage? We have used Merkelin tape and we've used proline as well, and we've not had any cut throughs, and we've been quite successful using both of them. So we've not had any reports. How easy is it to use the Merkelin tape in China? It is, it is quite difficult, and the uh, chances of white discharges, whether it is infective or non-infective, but the patients do come with white discharge after muscling tape, and so that's why we changed on to a thinner one, that is the proline, which has been quite successful with proline. So, and, so number and, one, one proline, because it's a nice heat also. Yes. Uh, yes. Miller, what is the role of antibiotics in circlage? Ma'am, for antibiotics, because it's not going to help, because you're are uh, not having a problem there and the post operative progesterone but i put them on pro post operative progesterone hoping yes. that the yeah hoping that it will reduce the chance for preterm delivery uh, manisha what is your uh, opinion on post operative progesterone for preterm delivery in a woman who's had uh, history uh, shows clear cut uh, cervical insufficiency manisha Instead of her, see, to say cervical insufficiency or incompetence, it means contractions are ruled out. It's a, it's a, it's an anatomical problem. When there's an anatomical problem, a mechanical suturing is what is required. If there are contractions for any reason, then okay, progesterone has a role. But if it is a clear cut of incompetence, which is very clear by the definition that there are no contractions of the uterus at all. In case of incompetence or insufficiency, there is no need of progesterone post operative. I agree with Murli, and uh, the evidence shows clearly shows that you don't use antibiotics, and there is absolutely no role for post operative progesterone when you do a cervical circlage. So uh, this is again a practical point from our book. Manisha, go ahead. Manisha, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I got lost in between. Yeah, as you as very rightly pointed out by Dr. Murthy, there, there is no indication for you to stop progesterone in this case, even for cervical insufficiency, yes. stitch is enough. Right. So it is it is something that, uh, unfortunately, progesterone has become the crutch for all obstetricians. They feel that they can use it for everything, and we need to get away from it. And for 32 years of my practice, I did not use progesterone as a support for pregnancy. 
I had a very big practice and I did not have miscarriages every day. So that you have to believe in yourself. I'm just going to quickly go through the procedure of a cervical circlage. We use only number one uh, proline because it's easier to use. The needle is shorter. The uh, indicate the place that you put it is where you see the vaginal rugae because that and so you, and the other thing is you need to use these deep beavers to be able to visualize the uh, uh, cervix well, you hold the cervix with ring holding forces. You use, take a good deep bite of number one proline uh, at, in all the four areas. Now, so you use this beaver here on this side when you are on the right side of the cervix. And the assistant, whoever is assisting you, has to keep changing the position. See, the position of the uh, ring holding forceps has now been changed. It's in the posterior uh, lip. And then you take this. And I found that keeping your elbow up uh, is easier to take the posterior stitch. Then again, you see how deep the, it goes in. It's very important not to take superficial little uh, stitches because this will help to prevent cut through. The, now the assistant keeps their finger in the, is watching the internal os. And as you tie, they tell you that yes, it's tightened well and they, it's not going through. So that is, I think, an extremely important uh, uh, technique, having that uh, finger there to make sure. And the end, I check and make sure that it, it's not loose. And if it is loose, I will put another suture. So you can see how fatalist that os is in this woman who's had a cervical uh, insufficiency. And then you again check and see if all your sutures are in place. It has to be high. We are going for the internal os. It's extremely important to place it high. Oh, goodness. Sorry, I'm trying to move. Uh, I'll go on. Right. So, uh, she, uh, her problems continued. Her history was that uh, PPROM and expulsion at 18 weeks followed, following mild cramping. She had had a cervical circlage at 12 weeks. And the next, the fifth pregnancy, again, was expulsion at 16 weeks. They had done a cervical circlage at 11 weeks. And during this pregnancy, she was also on complete bed rest. She was on vaginal progesterone. She was on uh, heparin and aspirin. Right. Do you agree with the treatment given to her, uh, Mudli? Therapy. <laughs> so you don't agree with that. Okay. So any of you agree with having to give uh, aspirin and heparin in this patient? No, I, no. no. On that. She came back. Should not. Yeah, she came back to us with her sixth pregnancy on examination. She was eight weeks pregnant, and cardiac activity was confirmed with ultrasound. But when we examined her, the cervix seemed very short and almost flush with the vault on clinical examination. This is a woman who's had two uh, cervical circlages, and both had failed. So at that point, we suggested an abdominal circlage since the cervix did not seem favorable for cervical circlage. At this point, uh, uh, Murli already mentioned a Shirod curse. Would you, uh, Manisha, do a Shirod curse at this point, or would you go with a abdominal circlage, or what would you do for this woman? Because that's very, very short. As you said in your findings, the cervix is very short and flush to vagina. I think technically doing a Shirod curse in this case, in this woman, would be challenging and might be prone to complications. So I would rather uh, uh, advise an abdominal circle rather than go for a shirod in this area. I agree yeah. with uh, Dr. Abdominal bit. It's important so much. Don't get. I think people hesitate to do an abdominal probably because there are very few that uh, uh, you would have experience with. May I? Put another person who does uh, Yes, pine open. Ma'am, I think uh, I would think in terms of a laparoscopic circlage for this particular. She was only eight weeks, and so I think uh, that's another viable option to think of. 
So in the sixth pregnancy, she counseled her several times. She was not willing for the abdominal circlage because she, uh, we had also told her that she could be delivered by uh, cesarean section. She went back to her earlier obstetrician, and in the, that pregnancy, cervical circlage was done. How they did it, I have no idea. She was also placed on regenerative progesterone, and she was on complete bed rest. She did not move. She developed DVT in the hospital. She was in the hospital throughout, and she developed DVT, for which she was treated with therapeutic doses of heparin, and of course, PPROM and painless expulsion at 22 weeks. In the seventh pregnancy, she came back to us. With, uh, came back to us at eight weeks because her obstetrician had referred her to us for abdominal circlage. Right. So as I said earlier, uh, is preconception laparoscopic circlage. And no but in, in uh, preconceptionally, would you think about it, Charmila? And think of a preconception of laparoscopic circlage. It would have been much uh, easier also. The bleeding may be much lesser compared to doing it during a pregnancy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, what is the problem with Is there any question of having secondary uh, infertility when a preconception laparoscopic circlage is done? So, subfertility, not infertility, but subfertility. I don't think so, ma'am. I don't think it, uh, it's a contributory factor for about infertility. It. But there is no, yeah. there doesn't seem to be no, a yeah. okay. for it. Right. I'm just going to quickly show uh, abdominal uh, We do it at 11 weeks. So, uh, uh, and we use a muslin tape, and it's very close to the uh, um, uterus itself. And we bring it across out posteriorly and make sure that it is coming through without twisting. Then it is held and the needle is cut off. The same thing is done on the other side. And after that, we, when we pull the uh, suture posteriorly, we make sure that it is flat and it's not curled up. And it has to be tied well. It has to be tied with square knots. We have to make sure, you can see here, square knots are being tied so that it does not slip. And that, of course, I believe that square knots should be tied for every uh, suture. I'm just putting that hand there so that the camera was going to uh, catch it better. Right. So once we have tied, uh, we tie about five to six knots. And once we have tied those knots, that uh, suture is uh, cut long. And uh, if that is just dipped into the cul-de-sac and left in place. We do not close the uterovesicular fold of peritoneum. We do not close the uh, parietal peritoneum. And then we go ahead with the uh, closure of the fascia. <laughs> so basically what <laughs> happened was after the abdominal circlage, she delivered a live baby girl, 3.2 kilos, by elective cesarean section at 37 weeks. What we can do, what would you do with the suture, uh, Murli or Manisha? Manisha, you do the abdominal circlage, circlage. What would you do with the suture at the cesarean section? Manisha? I think you could just leave it like that because she's definitely going to go for her next pregnancy. Muted. No, we can hear you, ma'am. We can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I would leave leave the stitch like that because that might be. No, ma'am, we can hear you. Yeah, Gita, ma'am, we can hear you actually. No, no. ma'am. You're, you're audible. Saying that you will leave the stitch, right? Yes. Yes. Hey, you, Gita. We're having a problem. No problem, right. Um, okay. Manisha, what would you do with the suture? I don't know if you already answered. No, yeah, she said she will leave the suture alone because the patient may plan another pregnancy. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, okay. can I have uh, anything to say? Yes, by Nepal? 
Ma'am, as usual, the panel was fantastic, but I thought we should also say that uh, progress and progressively, uh, probably in the next progress, we will think in terms of uh, introducing something called Arabic pessary for cervical insufficiency because uh, the people uh, around Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, blah, 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 they, they've never done a stitch in the last few years and they've been putting only Arabic pessary and there have been evidence, but not robust evidence coming in and so none of us have used Arabic pessary yet. But I thought sometime, point of time, we need to think in terms of pessary as well for cervical incompetence. I'm not getting, uh, to recommend it or use it now because we don't have a, uh, uh, I mean, we have experience with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, pineapple in the next edition of Essentials of Obstetrics. <laughs> but uh, there was uh, one Indian group who said they found that it not of important. much of use, ma'am, not of much it's, use. Uh, That's what one true. Indian group was saying. Yeah, it's not been uh, it's not been encouraged that much. Arabian pesky. Okay, okay, okay. Use okay. Yeah, I, I think I one group in Rajasthan used it or something, and they found uh, not much of benefit with using a pesky like that. That's what one study was there. Okay, right. It's up for this excellent uh, uh, progress 2020. I was really depressed when you said you are going to stop progress in 2007. <laughs> We still have one more talk. Just one more talk, exactly, sure. exactly. So sure. thank you, panelists. Thank yeah. you, panelists. Yeah. 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 Fantastic, okay. fantastic. Uh, yeah, great panel. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, Vijay, uh, I hope I hope, I hope my network holds. I'm just hoping for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it's all going to work. Yes. Yeah. Let's hope. Progress is running exactly on time, so go ahead. Everybody else, mute, please. Mute, everybody. Am I seen? Is my screen seen? Thanks. <laughs> so I have always, I have always scared of progress in the sense that whenever I present, it's it's like a benchmark for me. Every two years, I come for a test, and that test is in Chennai. Okay. And if I do well, and if Dr. Ma'am tells me my talk is good, I feel I've done something in fetal medicine. And that's why I was praying that this network holds up. And I must, th I must thank Kita Madam and Progress for giving me my first national talk and for putting me on a national platform. And it doesn't matter how many talks I have. If there is a call from progress, I'm going to drop everything and do that first. And that's, that has always been my commitment to Madam for being there when I was a complete and total novice in this field. So I'm hoping that the network holds. And I'm going to talk about a topic that is very close to my heart, and that is fetal growth restriction. And I've been asked to talk about one specific topic, and that is the small fetus with poor outcome. At the outset, I want to say that we have to understand very clearly that fetal growth restriction and smallness in size are not the same thing. They are not the same thing. And that is the first thing that all of you should walk away from. Because when we talk about smallness, we are only talking about a subset of fetal growth restriction which we are trying to identify. And when we talk about smallness, we talk about SGA on one hand, and we talk about fetal growth restriction, which is a totally different thing, and we try to equate both these things wrongly. And let me explain why. When we talk about an SGA fetus, we are essentially making a statistical definition. When we are looking at a fetus at any gestational age, and when we plot that fetus weight on that growth chart specific for that gestational age, and if you find that the fetal weight is less than the 10th centile, you make the diagnosis of SGA. It's as simple as that. It is an easy diagnosis to make. You have a chart, you plot the estimated fetal weight. If it is less than the 10th centile, you know that it is SGA. But SGR is not so simple. And the biggest error that we make is that we derive our definition of growth restriction by using smallness. And so when we see that a baby is less than the 10th centile, and has Doppler abnormalities to suggest that there is a problem resulting in this smallness, we call that baby growth restricted, and that is what we have been doing in this. And we find that the baby is very small. 
that is less than the third centile. Even with normal Doppler, we call that baby growth restricted. Now, I want all of you to understand that fetal growth restriction is not that. Fetal growth restriction is a functional problem of unmet fetal need, which means in each fetus has a genetic potential and it seems, when it seems to reach that potential, we call it growth restricted and sometimes these fetuses can be above the 10th centile. And if you look at the amount of babies that are dying close to term, you will find that 40% of these babies are not actually less than the 10th centile and they are above the 10th centile and growth restricted and we miss that completely. But that is a totally different story. Today I'm going to talk about the small fetus and how within that small fetus you have two distinct categories. One is early onset fetal growth restriction and the other one being late onset growth restriction. Now there is a lot of confusion here as to why early, why late and how are they so different. Well the answer to that lies within the placenta. Now if you look at the placenta center, you know that there are two compartments to that placenta. There is a fetal compartment and there is a maternal compartment. And the fetal compartment has got cotyledons, the placenta, and the, mater and the maternal compartment is the sinuses within which this placental cotyledons flow. So when you look at the maternal compartment of the placenta, it essentially the like artery supplies the maternal sinuses. And when we look at the fetal compartment, we are looking at the umbilical artery, which essentially supplies the placental cotyledons. And to understand why we have early and late onset growth restrictions, we should understand the 3070 concept. Let me tell you what the 3070 concept is. When we look at the placenta, and when we find that the placenta is damaged to more than 30 percent, let's say 40 to 50 or 60 percent of the placenta damaged, you would find that the umbilical artery becomes abnormal. And now because there is very, very little residual placenta for this baby, this baby is going to feel the pinch earlier on, is going to growth restrict earlier on, and therefore you are going to get early onset growth restriction. Greater the placenta damage, the chances of having more severe growth restriction and therefore this baby is going to show signs of growth restriction at an earlier gestation. Now imagine if that placental damage is less, it's less than 30%. If it is less than 30%, then the umbilical artery is going to be normal. 70% of the placenta is going to be completely normal and that placenta is good enough to sustain the fetus till around 32 to 33 weeks. And once it crosses 32 to 33 weeks, it needs more than that 70% and therefore when it is not able to get that extra placental share, it begins to grow to restrict and that is why I call this unmet fetal need. So this fetus needs more of that placenta but because around 30% of the placenta is damaged, there is not enough nutrition that can come into this fetus and therefore this baby begins to grow to restrict. Now if that placental damage was even lesser, Let's say around 10% to 20% of the placenta is damaged. This baby is going to grow the six even at a later date, at 36 weeks, at 37 weeks. And you may completely miss it because you will not be doing a scan at 36 or 37 weeks. And therefore, your scan at 32 or 33 weeks is about the 10th centile and you would completely miss out on a baby that is growth restricted because you didn't do that scan at 36 or 37 weeks. So essentially here, early and late basically means the degree of placental damage. More the placental damage, greater is the chance that there will be growth restriction earlier on, greater is the chance that there will be an umbilical artery abnormality. Lesser the placental damage, lesser the abnormality on the umbilical artery, greater the chance that this baby will growth restrict up to 32 or 33 weeks. Look at all the vessels that we have. The uterine artery looks at the maternal supply and therefore when you find that a baby is small, you look at the uterine artery and if you find that it is abnormal, it gives you a pathological cause of smallness and therefore it acts as a good diagnostic tool and a good screening tool in the first trimester. The umbilical artery on the other hand looks at the fetal compartment 
and tells you how bad the placenta is from the fetal side. But the problem with the umbilical artery is the 30% issue. If the placental damage is less than 30%, the umbilical artery is always going to be normal, and therefore in late onset growth restriction, your umbilical artery will not be showing you an abnormality. The middle cerebral artery tells you whether there is hypoxia. Now we know that in early onset growth restriction, where the baby is small, whether there is severe placental damage, the umbilical artery is going to be severely abnormal, and therefore it is a given that there is going to be hypoxia because of the centralization reflex. But when the baby is growth restriction later on, the umbilical artery is normal, and therefore the pro probably the only sign of a pathological cause of smallness will be to look at the middle cerebral artery where it will show signs of hypoxia. So when you have a baby that is less than the 10th centile later on in pregnancy, showing signs of hypoxia, you should think of late onset growth restriction. But the problem here is that sometimes the middle cerebral artery may be just at that border and may not be completely abnormal. And the umbilical artery at the same time will be at that border and not be completely abnormal. That's why a combination of both, the cerebroplacental ratio, that is the pulse vitality index of the MCA divided by the pulse vitality index of the umbilical artery is going to give you an idea as to whether this baby has got hypoxia or not. And therefore, in late onset growth restriction, looking at the CPR will tell you if this baby is having hypoxia or not. The other venosis, on the other hand, looks at the baby's heart and tells you whether the baby's heart is compensating to this hypoxia or not. It tells you whether acidosis is present or not, and therefore its role basically lies in early onset growth restriction, where there is a chance of cardiac failure secondary to severe umbilical artery abnormality. When the umbilical artery is normal, as is the case in late onset growth restriction, the ductus venosus will always be normal, and therefore there is no rule of looking at the ductus venosus in late onset growth restriction. So coming back to the small fetus. So when you have a baby that is less than the 10th child, and if you find that the umbilical artery is abnormal, it tells you that the placental damage is greater than 30%, and obviously this baby would growth restrict at an earlier gestation, and therefore you would call it early onset growth restriction. But for late onset growth restriction and SGA, the umbilical artery is going to be normal because the placental damage is not that significant to cause an abnormality in the umbilical artery. And therefore, you make the diagnosis of late onset growth restriction when you see that a baby is small and becomes small after 30 to 36 weeks and the umbilical artery is normal. Now, I said to make the diagnosis by looking at the estimated CT rate after 32 to 34 weeks. Now that is the easiest question done because sometimes these babies begin to grow to restrict at 32 weeks and they show a complete clear cut sign of growth restriction that is estimated CT is less than the test center only later on. And therefore, if you have a second ultrasound at 36 to 37 weeks, that is the time probably when you can pick it up. So that was what was shown in the study. If you do another ultrasound at 36 weeks, you increase the chances of picking up late onset growth restriction at least two times more. So there is a doubling in your detection rate. Let me give you an example to prove what I have said. Now look at this patient. Now this baby had a completely normal growth scan, normally scan at 19 weeks. And if you see this estimated CT weight, you can see that it's touching the green line. It's around on the 50th centile. We called her back, and then here you can see that the estimated CT width is at the 39th centile at around 30 to 33 weeks. Now, normally, we would call the patient for a repeat ultrasound later on. But when we did a repeat ultrasound at 37 weeks, this is what we saw. We found that the estimated CT weight dropped down to the 5th centile. And now, this is why you would have completely missed this baby if you did an ultrasound at 32 weeks and found that the estimated CT weight was at 34th centile. The growth velocity also looked okay, but when we did another scan at 36 to 37 weeks, we found that this baby dropped and fell off the chart. This is again because of the 30-70 concept. Because the baby does not feel the pinch till around 32 to 34 weeks, 
But once it crosses that, and because around 70% of the placenta is only available for this baby, this baby begins to grow to restrict after 30 to 30 weeks, and you identify them only at around 37 weeks. And if you don't identify them, there, are, there is a good chance these babies would die. So once you pick up a baby that is small, then you are left with the most important question. Is this pathological smallness or not? And for that, you look at three things. The first thing being signs of hypoxia. So you look at your NCA, you look at your CPR, and if you find that there is a sign of hypoxia, you're definitely looking at late onset growth restriction. You look at the maternal supply, you look at the uterine artery, and if you find that the uterine artery is abnormal, again, you have a pathological cause of smallness. And therefore, that is also late onset growth restriction. But if the baby is very small, that is less than the third centile, and irrespective of what your Doppler tells you, you're looking at a group of babies that are going to have poor perinatal outcome, and therefore they're automatically classified as late onset growth restriction. So let me put that in a nutshell for you. If you have a baby that is small, and if you find that the umbilical artery is abnormal, that means there is severe placental dysfunction, this baby has become growth restricted earlier on, and therefore you're looking at early onset growth restriction. If the umbilical artery is normal and the baby is less than the 10th center after 32 to 34 weeks, you look for signs of hypoxia, you look at maternal supply, and you look at the estimated PT weight and see if it is less than the third centile. If any of these three things are abnormal, you would call them late onset growth restriction. But if it is fine, the third centile, the Dopplers are normal, everything is fine, you would call them SGA. And once you have made your diagnosis, of smallness, then comes the difficult part. How do you manage the small baby? Now, when it comes to early onset growth restriction, the protocol is very clear because you know that this baby has begun to growth restrict at an earlier gestational age and will follow a sequence of progression that you have learned over and over again. The umbilical artery becomes abnormal. The heart tries to push blood against the increased resistance in the umbilical artery and begins to fail, you have an abnormality in the ductus venosus, you have an abnormality in your CTG, and the baby finally dies. So you have a sequence of events, a timeline of events, and when you have a sequence or a timeline of events, what does that tell you? You have a chance to make a protocol, a protocol that will allow you to make the distinction between the severity of IUDR and thereby plan your management in such a way that you can decide when you want to see this baby again, and also when you want to deliver that. The frequency of surveillance, as well as the timing of delivery, can be assigned very well in early onset growth restriction because they follow a sequential progression. So having said that, once you know your sequence of progression, and once you know the abnormality that you're looking at, you can classify them into various stages. So stage one would be a stage where you have a baby that is less than the 10th centile, has increased resistance in the umbilical artery, but the veins are normal. The ductus venosus is normal, and all the other veins are normal. It means there is hypoxia, but there is no decompensation. Stage two is when you have an increased resistance within the umbilical artery. So you have an absent end diastolic flow within the umbilical artery, but the heart is still good. The ductus venosus flow is still good. There is still no signs of decompensation. So you're looking at severe hypoxia. In stage three, now the heart is beginning to feel the pinch. You have a severe abnormality in the umbilical artery, like a reversed end diastolic flow, which tells you that more than 70% of this placenta is damaged, and the DVPI is going to be high, which tells you that the heart is feeling the strain. So you're looking at possibility of acidosis here. And stage four, would be when the DV reverses completely, and therefore you know that the heart is going to fail, you have to take this baby out, or this baby will die. So once you have classified them into stages, you are automatically classifying the severity of the disease. And once you know the severity of the disease, you will know when to see them next. Stage one, where you have hypoxia, you know that this baby is is doing well, it is adjusting to its adverse environment. There is hypoxia, but it is adjusting, therefore you can call them on a weekly basis, and if the status quo remains, you can take them up to term. 
In stage two, you have severe hypoxia. This baby is actually struggling to maintain and keep its heart good. Therefore, you're going to call this baby on a week, on twice in a week. And therefore, you're going to be very, very closely watching this baby, worried whether this baby will be able to hold its own. And you will try to push this pregnancy till around 32 to 34 weeks. Once the DVPI starts to raise, that is in stage three, and the umbilical artery is showing reversal, you know that this baby is now on dangerous ground. This baby is trying very hard to stabilize itself, which means you have to be more watchful, you have to be more careful. You're going to do ultrasound every other day. You want to keep your eyes on this baby and you try to take this baby to around 28 to 32 weeks until you find that the lungs are mature and you're going to take this baby out. Once the DV reverses, it's clearly, clearly saying that the baby is thrown in the towel. This baby has decided to give up and you have now to take this baby out and try to save this baby provided this baby has a chance of survival outside. There is no sense in trying to take out a baby that is 24 weeks and has a DV reversal because you know that that baby will not survive. So when we do that, you have to also understand a very important thing. 60% of babies that have early onset growth restriction are going to have preeclampsia. So it would be foolish to just look at the baby and then keep on going, but you should understand that these babies, mothers may have preeclampsia, and you have to time your delivery based on your doctor's diagnosis. Coming to late onset growth restriction, the sequence of events is not going to be there. The umbilical artery is normal. There is no decompensation of the heart. The problem is going to be on the brain stem. The brain stem is going to feel the pain because hypoxia is not going to affect the heart now. It is going to affect the brain. And when the brain stem becomes suppressed, this baby will die because of brain stem suppression and your Doppler is not going to pick it up. And therefore, you should clearly understand that the management of growth restriction in late onset growth restriction does not rely on Doppler. You would, yes, look at your CPR and your NCA, but they are essentially to decide when you want to call them up for surveillance. So in late onset growth restriction, you will look at the CPR, you will look at the MCA, but not going to decide on preterm delivery based on that. You would decide to do your preterm delivery before 38 weeks in late onset growth restriction only by looking at the brain stem. That means if you look at the CTG and you look at your biophysical profile, you would continue these pregnancies and try to deliver them at 38 weeks because if you deliver them by 38 weeks, you are directly reducing the mortality in that group by around 50%. But having said that, you have to look at your CPR, the CTG, and the biophysical profile. The CPR, if it is low, tells you that you have to increase your surveillance in late onset growth restriction, do a daily CTG, look at the biophysical profile, and if they are normal, you can continue the pregnancy till 38 weeks. But if any of them are abnormal, you would try to deliver before 38. Otherwise, there is no indication for delivering a baby before 38 weeks in late onset growth restriction. I hope that's very clear because people all over the country are now delivering for bad CPR. Bad CPR is not an indication for early delivery. You do your weekly once Doppler, do your CTG once weekly, and if you find that the CPR is falling, be cautious. That does not mean you deliver. You increase your surveillance, add in a CTG, look at the biophysical profile, ask the mother to monitor the count of the baby, more, 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 and be more and more fresh. So to conclude, when you look at early onset growth restriction and late onset growth restriction, there are two distinct phenotypes of the same disease. You're basically looking at the difference in the placental damage, 70 to 30 percent. So while early onset growth restriction is a problem of perfusion, late onset growth restriction is a problem of diffusion. And the saddest part here is that we are so good at managing early onset growth restriction because it stares at you in the face and we completely miss out on late onset growth restriction and that's why 40% of our babies are dying in the third trimester and it is something that needs our immediate attention. Thank you, thank you for listening and thank you for BSNL for holding us. Thanks so much. You met the mandate of the topic perfectly. That's why I always have you on, in progress. It was so clear. And you clear, because this is one of those issues where people lose babies and they don't know what they did or did not do right. And I think you brought it together beautifully. Thank you so much.
Absolutely fantastic talk, Bijoy. And it's not an easy topic, but you really made it extremely clear. Congratulations. And thank I'd like to thank all our participants, uh, both the ones, the delegates uh, in the hundreds who have signed in, and our uh, uh, participants, our faculty, who are just so brilliant. It, it was such, I love progress because I love uh, listening to very clear minds. Lakshmi. Before we ask for the vote of thanks, I just thought um, I should um, express um, yours and mine our gratitude to the team Walters Clover. Um, because now we will hand over to them uh, for proposing the vote of thanks. I would like to start with uh, Walika, who has worked with us, she's the developmental editor. And uh, Gita and I have established a special relationship and a rapport with her, starting with, I started with her with the, uh, the uh, obstetric, essentials of obstetric uh, first edition, then I continue on to the, continued on to the second edition, Gaini, and now the second edition of uh, essentials of obstetrics. And um, she is the most wonderful, awesome developmental editor ever for everything that you have done for this book. Without you, we wouldn't have been able to come out with this book at all. We also have Pooja, Megha, and Gopal Sharma, the typewriter. Wonderful, accomplished, and dedicated people. We've enjoyed, absolutely enjoyed working with you. And Sangeeta, the senior manager, you have been a pillar of support as always because you are the person whom you are my first contact with Walter's Clover started in 2010 with, or 2008 when I started writing the uh, the first Gaini book. Okay, Ravi Shukla, the and um, the, the publishing manager and the and, and Mr. Sharavanan, um, who been very helpful in organizing this webinar and um, that along with the salespeople, they are the ones who are going to make sure that the book reaches all of you. Thank you very much, Team Walters Clover from Gita and me. Thanks all the participants and thanks all the panelists. Uh, Dr. Gita, may I tell something about the book? Yes, please. Please, Murli. It's a wonderful book. It's a so complete, so informative, so updated, and so illustrative, so easy to read. <coughs> I know exactly what it takes being an author myself, the All Indian Bros, fourth edition. Now I'm getting butterflies in the stomach. Should I venture <laughs> editing the fifth edition at all? Uh, because it is really comprehensive and it is very user-friendly, especially you have updated with the uh, competency-based uh, medicine and the illustrations are wonderful and I'm sure it's going to be a bestseller. It will be sold like hotcakes. So congratulations to both of you, madams. And it's Thank really, you. really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Murali. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. Coming from you, a very good teacher. I think it's good, important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can't see it, but I am close to tears. Thank you, Murali. Thank you so much. Can we have the Walters to Clover team give us give the a vote of thanks, please? It was a great session. I am sure uh, the participants will agree with me. Uh, on behalf of Walters Clover, I wish to thank each and every one of you who have made today's event a grand success. It has been a pleasure listening to the key speakers and panelists who shared insights about various topics. I wish to thank Dr. Gita Arjun for arranging such a great event. Arranging it as a virtual webinar has its own challenges, but the event has proved it otherwise. Dr. Gita Arjun has been consistently conducting progress for the past several years, and even a pandemic cannot stop her. So on behalf of her, our congratulations to you, ma'am. As of thanks for the uh, I can say it's a moment of pride and honor to introduce and launch the iconic book, Essentials of Obstetric Second Edition, in this event. We could not have hoped for a better platform. We really appreciate the time and efforts put in by both the authors in building this book in the midst of their own commitments. 
this talk will be shortly available in your nearby medical bookshops and very much available now in online stores like amazon and flipkart we have had amazing participants who on a weekend decided to invest their time in this event it's really overwhelming the recording of the webinar will be made available on our youtube channel and the participants will be notified about this event through this registered email id i take this opportunity to acknowledge my colleagues in publishing especially my sankita dr valika devi is mega fan who worked on this book tirelessly i and i want to make a special mention of about uh, my colleague mr ravi shukla who has been instrumental in seriously organizing this event today thanks sir thanks again my sincere thanks to one and all thank you thank you thank you so we this yes yes thank you everybody thanks <laughs> thank you geetha ma'am and thank you lakshmi ma'am thank you so much yeah thank you thank you thanks the joy and this thank you ma'am be there bye bye bye, bye.